Okay, this is Joe McEntee here for the Rock Fantasy Files. It's been a little while. We're doing a show with King Fowley and Deceased in October 31st, or 31, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, we have uh, Dennis Brath here, or am I saying it wrong? I don't know. But anyway, our <laughs> trusty host, who I know real well, I, I could pronounce his last name wrong, uh, Robin <laughs> Mason, Amazing Mason, the, what was it? What does um, Steve call you? The manager to the stars. I, guess, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Stephen Craig. Um, also work the rock fantasy. And we have, was it R Ralph Trambora or how do you pronounce it properly? I don't want to be rude. Yeah. You there? Yeah. You're frozen on me. Yeah. Okay, good. Anyway. Um, yeah, we have King Folly from deceased. I mean, if you're into death metal and you don't know deceased, you probably shouldn't even be watching this now because I mean, it's really one of the most important band especially in our area i mean you know they were around pretty much when all the other bands were kind of starting out um you know before even i was doing stuff and a lot of my peers were doing stuff to trucking away you know king's always been a very outspoken person and i've always respected that of him because he just you know he tells you the way he sees it and if you don't like it you don't like it but i mean that's the way it should be anyway not everybody has to agree on everything and i always respected that in him which there's so many people in the music industry that will bullshit you and tell you how cool you are and then talk shit behind your back or whatever the situation is and king folly's definitely not one of them if he doesn't like you you probably will probably let you know especially back in his drinking days for sure <laughs> maybe maybe he's eased up a little bit <laughs> but hey uh, watch it suck it's pronounced <laughs> now just because you pronounced my last name right it gotta be wrong now <laughs> cool well uh, yeah no just yeah just real quick on that um i just was gonna say like you know with what you just said about you know always speaking your mind it ain't to talk shit it ain't it ain't to upset no. nobody it ain't to you know be anything it's always just been like a thing where i've just i just always felt like you need to tell the no. truth you need to say how it is we don't gotta agree well i, I got people they don't have to like deceased or you know whatever but it's it's the people along the way that just don't want to that just don't want to like let you be yourself like it's a long it's a long story you just going in if you want to go down the, the line with like say relapse i couldn't be myself over there you couldn't say what you felt you had to hide things and i thought Part of what my life is, even outside of music, is, is an underground thing. I like to be genuine. I don't like to play that kind of shit. So, you know, here it is, what, 35, 36 years later with Deceased and all that stuff. I've just always, even as a kid, my mom always said, speak the truth. It'll be the best way to go about it. It's just how you present it to people, you know. And like you said about the drinking days, in those days, it was more of a less respect to what I'm saying about. Now it's just like, hey, if you'd like something, you like it. If not, that's why we all get our own names, man, to be our own, our own self, man. Well, I just wanted I mean, to that, say that early on. <laughs> no, it's, I think it, well, it's an important thing because people think just because you might not be a fan of something that, you know, you, there has to be an issue where you're trying to be. Uh, about it. It's not that it's just voicing, voicing your opinion. Everybody has an opinion and it's, it's okay to have an opinion, at least a, at least in my opinion, it is. I always respect <laughs> that, you know. I, I I always like the fact that when I talk to you about whatever the topic is, you tell me honestly what you think of something, you know. You never bullshit me and try to tell me, you know. I mean, you know, being in a band, so many people will come up to me and try, you know, tell me how great they think my band is just to get in favor with me. And But it's like, you, you know, you don't have to do that. If, if, you know, you think my band sucks, it's okay, you know. Right. I mean, we don't even have we don't even have to not be friends or nothing. It has nothing to do with what what you look exactly. like. I think I know? think a lot of my stuff. Yeah, I think I, for me, a lot of my my stuff goes back to like when we were all coming up the scene. Like I was never a Metallica guy. And when it yeah. came out, everybody was in love with Metallica. It just wasn't for me. It was just, it was just never for me when I got to yeah. kill them all, you know, I just thought it was, I didn't think it was fast. I didn't think it was heavy. I didn't think it was anything for me. And I just said that back to people like, oh, you're just trying to be different. You're just trying to be the one guy out there. And I'm like, no, I'm being genuine with you, dude. I was like, I'm listening to this. I'm not hearing the heavy. I was into Venom and all that stuff then. And all the punk stuff like MDC and stuff was ahead of that and Dead Kennedys for me for speed. I just thought when it came out, I thought it was like Judas Priest. It was like boogie rock to me. That's what I literally thought. 
And I had some people that were like, yeah, you know, I, I feel the same way. I'm glad you think that. And other people thought, you know, you're a fucking idiot, blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. You know what I'm saying? But that's kind of where all that came in the music thing for me. It kind of like out of the gate. And that was, nobody knew who I was back then. We'd go to shows and they'd be like, this dude doesn't like Metallica. Like the guys in Deceased when I met him, Mark and Mike were like, wow, he doesn't like this Metallica. That's crazy. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but I mean, it just it, it, if you not liking Metallica doesn't make let me make, make other people not like them. It doesn't matter if exactly. someone else like who well, cares. Yeah, if, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you're that easy to sway, do. man, you're out. See, Robin's she's passionate and defending her, defending what she loves. Robin, what Robin love likes Robin likes Metallica enough for all of us here, so we don't have to worry about it if you like Metallica. <laughs> she'll like go. she'll like it for us. <laughs> there you go. I have enough Metallica love to spread. <laughs> but, but I'm not um, sharing. But I. Have, the yeah, so I guess basically we'll just go go around and just uh, or whatever. I don't really know. I guess we didn't really even talk about it if you want to do what's that? Is are you freezing only for me or other people? No, for it's me freezing too. for me too. Okay. Am I freezing yeah. a lot? Yeah. 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 Oh, that yeah you're sucks. freezing and then like you reappear and then you speak super fast to catch up to like your <laughs> reality self. Sweet. But it's kind of cool. Well, that's cool. I'll just imagine what you're saying. Hospital, it's fine. I don't know. I, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Something. Let me, I don't know. I've, just for the hell of it, because I'm on Wi Fi here, I'll try opening up my door, see if it helps let some of the, um, the signal in a little bit. Never know. There he goes. He's getting freezing again. Better put a jacket on. He like disappeared. Holy like fuck, that was cool. That was amazing. You disappeared. Like David Copperfield weird. there. You were there, weird. and then you were not there, and then you like kind of. Like... <laughs> cool. Well, this is hey, awesome. But anyway, stack on solved mystery shit. Good luck. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I guess you know, but um, yeah, like I said, I don't really know what, what we were t uh, thinking about if we were picking any songs or if we were just going to ask questions or whatnot but um you know what the hell we'll start with um we'll start with steve how about that sure that's fine i'm i'm good with that i'm i'm always ready to roll but uh <laughs> yeah um you know i i heard about kingy way back in the day uh i used to actually <laughs> live down in baltimore maryland so i grew up somewhat close to where you grew up and um I moved away when I was about 15, and uh, I guess when I was about 20, I started hearing the name uh, Deceased and hearing about you and some stories and stuff, and uh, I think this was maybe when you were going through your barefoot days, because somebody was saying that you never used to wear shoes for a while. I'm not sure if it was that was that's the time. Long, that's a lot of days, man. That's a lot of years. Yeah, that's crazy, though, but uh, uh, you never wore shoes anyway, right? Never. I mean, what? dude, that was just, I don't want to even call it the no shoes days. It was really the drugged out of my fucking gourd days, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I always, will do that to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I always stayed away from that. I was warned the dangers of that by my dad early on. So that shit always scared me. I was always scared right. I was going to get hit and run around. And, you know, I, I didn't want to be that guy. You know what I mean? So. Absolutely. And it was prevalent back then, too, you know. But, uh. Yeah, so, you know, I started hearing stories about you. And, of course, when I saw uh, the first EP with uh, the cover from one of my favorite movies of all time, Black Sabbath, I mean, man, that movie freaked me out, man. Especially that episode. That face on that lady, holy crap, man. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was just something else, man. I, I still remember seeing that movie when I was maybe, like, five years old uh, with the lights out in my aunt's bedroom. Uh, with the black and white TV on and seeing that and oh shit, man, that scared the shit out of me. So anytime I ever heard a drip at, at night, you know, I, I was out of there, you know, I was under the covers. <laughs> right on. But uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, honestly, uh, going to what John was saying, uh, my favorite thing about you, man, is that you're, you're hardcore, you're punk, you are yourself. That's truly being hardcore and punk. No matter, it's not wearing, having a mohawk or being a skinhead. It's just being you. It's speaking your mind. And just being you, and I've, I've always respected that about you, and I was fortunate enough to finally meet you, uh, even though we probably crossed paths about a dozen times, uh, finally when uh, I was playing in Primeval, you know, and that's when we finally started talking and everything, and uh, right. right away, the one thing that I always loved is that, you know what, you always respected whatever my opinion was, but didn't necessarily agree with it, but that was cool, you know, and uh, 
you know, the thing is, too, is you also love all sorts of different kinds of music, which I always thought was really cool, too. You're not pigeonholed into the, the death metal. You know, it's got to be heavy, heavy. You know, you remember classic rock. I mean, growing up when we grew up back then, FM radio was something, you know. And, Absolutely. Uh, we had that one channel out of D.C. Uh, that was the one that played the Midnight Metal, or I think it was Monday DC Night. 101. Oh, man. I mean, they play Anvil, Metal on Metal. I mean, just crazy, crazy that was shit. Bit, that, was, that's, was, that was my youth, man. Every Monday at midnight, they played not a song by these bands, but the fucking entire records. And it was Man of War Battle Hymns. It was Anvil, Metal on Metal. It was nice. The Rods, Wild Dogs. It was um, Baron Rojo, Vinyam and Brutal, Tank, uh -huh. Power of the Hunter. I mean, they played these albums all the way through. Sound Barrier, Heaven, Y&T, then stuff that became known, like they played Twisted Sister Under the Blade, Too Fast for Love, Motley Crue. Every week it was something. And we were all, I was always taping it. And when you know, I got to know Steve here on Facebook and stuff, we talked about that. It was so cool. I still have some of the tapes. And all, the only problem is most of them I taped over because once I heard them and loved them, I bought the records. So I taped something else over them. And it was cool in the old days, the DJ would come on and you'd hear like, all right, here's side one of vandenberg or whatever the fuck it was and it was so cool uh -huh. saxon strung under the law i think i still have that one where the guy actually says here's side two of strung under the law and that's so cool now because you would never hear that unless it was yeah. a college radio station now you know right yeah that was crazy man it was just such a great time i was uh living with my aunt right about that time i we had moved to new york but then um the summer of uh, 11th grade and 12th grade, I went down and lived with my aunt. She lived over in Joppa, Maryland, which was near the uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And uh, okay. the, the White Marsh Mall was over there. And uh, there was another uh, store over there. And I used to go there. And that's where I would get all my new wave of British heavy metal fix, like Angel Witch and uh, A2Z was another one that I loved. Yeah, the store, the store up there, what, was it Music Machine you went to? I believe that was the one, yeah. If that I'm not store had it all, man. That was the best store. And that was like right over by Glen Burnie, like sort mm -hmm. of near Glen Burnie. That yeah, was the my, best uh, store there was. Nope, nothing yeah. better. You could find Bulldozer Records. All the, all the cool shit back then was in that store. Yeah, my cousin lived in Glen Burnie. Actually, I, he's pretty sure he still does right now. But uh, yeah, that was cool, man. There was a lot of good stores there. There was actually a real good one in Pikesville, too, that we used to go get some really cool stuff. I, I picked up stuff like uh, the Motorhead uh, 45 set of... Um, like a nightmare they had three different covers they had like the full set there for like 15 bucks and that's a hell of a lot of money back then but you know you had oh, yeah. a way found a found a way of getting it but anyway you know uh i've always uh really liked the seas i think what i love the most about you guys is uh super original man i mean you guys are kind of like i would say like original like voivod is original like you don't sound like anybody else you can hear different things where like you know, you'll pay like a little bit of tribute. You can hear like, oh yeah, that kind of sounds like maybe like a Maiden type of riff or that sounds like, uh, you know, a Saxon riff or something like that. But it never quite sounds like that. You always kind of do your own thing, you know? And uh, I've always super appreciated that, man. You know, uh, it's just, uh, it's good stuff. It's very refreshing in uh, a time and day when everybody so uh, wanted to sound like everybody else. You know, everybody was trying to sound like Morbid Angel and you guys were trying to sound exactly the opposite, but not on purpose, you know? But uh, another thing that I actually love uh, the most, and I'm going to have to get something out of you for this episode, is uh, one of your stories from back in the day, because some of the stories were just so funny. Like uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, the one when you uh, went into the dressing room with David Vincent and he was uh, had a <laughs> conversation with you, but he was shaving his legs at the time. It was, no, it was, he, we, we played a show. Well, <laughs> we played a show. It was um, Creator. Morbid Angel, Deceased, and Paradise Lost. Well, they decided they didn't want to play. Morbid Angel had a problem with the club, which the club had no problem. They just were in some kind of quirk where they were supposedly burning a lot of clubs and not, not playing shows, but keeping the, the uh, guarantees and things. And it happened at this show. And I just happened to talk to Dave, and I was wearing a Leibach shirt, the man Leibach, that day. And he told me, he said, yeah, man, can I get that shirt or can you get me one? And then he said, why don't you come up to New York? We're going to be doing some shows blah, 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 and with some other bands. And I'm not the world's biggest Morbid Angels fan, as everybody knows. But I was like, all right, we'll go up to New York, hang out with some friends and stuff, which we did. And I brought him the shirt. And he said, yeah, come back here to the back area. Well, when I went in the back area, he wasn't wearing nothing but a black flag shirt. Everything else was, was just buck naked. And he just sat there for like 10 minutes trying to talk to me. And I know, I know the Europeans do it all the time. And Frank from Blackfire from Creator did it three different occasions. But fucking, I was just sitting there like, what in the fuck? And he was like, 
yeah, man. He was in. It's just the Dave Vincent serious tone too. He's just like, thanks so much, King Fowley. Thank you. You know, and he's just sitting there. I was just couldn't fucking stop laughing, man. It was so funny. And they had this big fucking baby pool of beer, and I'm sitting there drinking the beers. He's like, yeah, I love Liebach. He goes into this story. It was just a fucking ridiculous night, man. It was. It was ridiculous. <laughs> It was yeah. one of those ones you, unfor- one of the ones you don't want to be there, but unfortunately, I was there. Thanks, man. <laughs> thank you, Mister. Thank you, Mister Fowley. Here, thanks for the shirt. And he's just standing there, like he's <laughs> fucking at the door. It was weird. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to have a conversation to a dude when he's got his dick hanging out. I went through that. I, it was just it was just odd. I mean, you know, hey, I grew up. I went to, I went to fucking junior high school. And that's all there was after fucking gym class. And I don't care, teach their right. own. But it, it was the it just went on and on. It was like we were having a fucking dinner like that or something, man. It was like fifteen <laughs> minutes, man. It's like all right, see you later. No, no, whoa, 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 you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. And Petey was back there the whole time just smoking up, and uh, it was it was funny. It was funny to me. And next That's time we meet, I'll do the same thing. I'll just like drop my pants. That's fine. Me. We'll all do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, I was gonna, I, that in my hockey days. You know, we used to play, and there was a couple guys that were a little bit older. And older guys, like they would do stuff. Like I guess when they were younger, they talk about how they find a swimming hole and they'd all like strip down and jump in the swimming hole and swim around nude. I'm like, no, no thanks, brother. But there was it's this just, one. It's just this is taking Bobby. an ugly turn. Fuck <laughs> 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 the fuck you. <laughs> anyway, Bob no, was I, like, yeah. but no, Bobby it was, was a like, crazy story. Yeah, no doubt, man. I love that. But uh, anyway, this guy Bobby was like fifty years old, and uh, we were all like in our uh, younger, you know, our early thirties, and uh, he was an old gym teacher, and he would, you know, after the hockey game, he would just drop his clothes, take it right off. Come <laughs> dick hanging out he'd be sitting down changing his dick would be right about eye level and i used to say to him like bobby you know like i've seen this before but this is making me a little uncomfortable go put your dick away and then we'll have a conversation you know so but anyway i guess we're way off subject for a rock band. Uh, yeah I, think- I, I don't even know how to play with this. it's enough there, microphone talk what is happening right now <laughs> but anyway robin's uh, gone yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm like uh okay uh, uh, sorry <laughs> I didn't, I didn't mean to mortify you, but uh, no, I, I, I think I'm yeah. just, I don't know like what that. happened. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm just, I, I lost I my, ca- I lost I some, of that, con- some of that black Sabbath technical ecstasy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to contribute to the conversation. Part yeah. of the conversation. going to see this and say no more Levin on these episodes. He's done. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, though, so, uh, in my notes, I put down some stuff uh, from Luck of the Corpse. I, I love fading survival, uh, experimenting with failure. Uh, Blueprints to Madness, which uh, was my favorite album for a while uh, from you guys. Uh, I love Island of the Unknown and uh, the title track and uh, especially Mind Vampires, which is just such a great song, man. And uh, then uh, Fearless Undead Machines. uh, I think that that actually is my favorite album right now, man. That is uh, that's still one I go back and listen to quite often. Uh, Silent Creature is a great song. The title track. uh, the atmospheric, which I love, uh, from the ground they came. That's a, a, a just, it's a great song. It just sets up for my favorite song, which uh, Night of the Deceased. It's probably my favorite song from you guys. Well, man. My favorite too, nice. man. That's always yeah. almost always the opener, man. I love that. I like that one too. Yeah, that fearless is going to go down. It's always the one that people always say the most. I enjoy it. It's about my fourth or fifth favorite, deceased. If I if I, my favorite deceased is Supernatural Addiction, and the reason why is because for me the lyrics and the the themes and the music match up. The best we ever got it, I think. But Fearless was the one that sort of started the change because Mike Smith, uh, who became like the lead writer at that time, just said after Blueprints, he, he was totally scatterbrained when he joined the band. He joined after Luck of the Corpse, but his picture's on the record. And so he came in for 13 Frightened Souls and we wrote he wrote that song and me and Mark sort of wrote Robotic Village, which were the two new ones on that EP. And then we did a couple old ones and then we did the Voivod cover. But then it came to Blueprints for Madness and he was just like, well, what are you kind of going for? I said, I don't know what we're going to do yet, but we're, you know, I want it to be fast and crazy. And we originally that record was going to be 20. It was going to be 20 songs, two minutes each. That was the original idea. But when yeah. we were doing that record, we basically had to go uh, keep moving practice spaces and it became the blueprints for madness to find a place to jam. So we started taking like two or three of the songs and putting them together to make one song. Like for example, into the bazaar on that one, 
that one like it ended up being seven minutes it was a bunch of different songs so that was kind of where it was but mike didn't feel comfortable and by the time we got to fearless we had settled in my basement of my house with a, uh, we built a, a band jam room inside of the basement with walls walls inside of walls and Mike came in and the first thing he played me was the silent creature, which had that wasted years kind of iron maiden vibe to it, which it went to that verse, which was, I thought very seven gates of hell venom like, and Mike said, I just feel more comfortable writing like this. I said, dude, this is fine. I said, this is cool. You know, and this is, this is good because John's here. Like, and John plays more of a guttural death metal thing, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I, like when I was growing up, like things like, Metal Church were considered death metal. Surf on Gold was considered death metal. This is like before the big gur. This is even before like really possessed and you know all that stuff uh, was was doing its thing. And I was always like, well, I like that, but I kind of like this too. So I wanted to kind of combine it. And I think that's where we kind of got our like awkwardness to us. And then the rhythms were kind of awkward on drums because I never was self taught, and I just kind of threw myself on a kit and started playing this weird combination. And I thought I played more punk. Than, than full on metal kind of thing. Double bass was never my thing. I, my hands is my strength. My feet is my is my weakness when it came to playing drums. And I just think it all kind of crossbred each other and kind of lots of shit came out. And we and back in the earliest days of Deceased, we only played, we were the only band doing anything like that in the area, Northern Virginia. Now, Southern Virginia at war was playing like that more motorhead, thrashy speed metal kind of thing. They were definitely there too, but down our way, it was only punk rock bands, LD kids, learning disabled kids, um, psychotic symptoms, creeping corpse. It was these, it was these punk rock kids whose their parents were doctors and they had these mansions and we'd go play out in their fields. They'd have skinhead bands and all this shit. And we were the only band. And they'd be like, what the fuck is this? I'm like, it's Sodom. It's sepulchral voice from Sodom. This is Bathory war. We were covering these songs at parties and they didn't know what to hit them. Bombs of death, Iraqs. Chemical Warfare, Hell, Hell Awaits intro into Chemical Warfare. So by the time we started writing a lot of our originals, that war, you know, was definitely what came into the play too. And then we wanted to be like everybody else wanted to be. We wanted to be the fastest, the sickest, the spookiest and all that shit. You know, we wanted to be weird like Voivod, uh, evil like Venom, faster than Slayer, whatever the fuck it was. And that's kind of like how it all came together. But, you know, going full circle back to Fearless, so later on when we got to that, I always thought the heavy metal part was cool too because even if you listen to the first demo, Evil Side of Religion, the first thing I ever wrote for the band was March of the Cadavers, the instrumental. That's more of a man of war type thing than anything else. It's the only one that's mid-paced on the whole fucking demo. But Right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where it was for me, Steve. That's why, you know, with Fearless, people think that's the one that I guess it just hit at a good time because a lot of people weren't playing metal anymore at that time. It was a bad word. And all we wanted to do was was play fucking metal. I remember trying to put the re record out on relapse, and we had a sticker: no Pantera beards, no fucking yo boy breakdowns. They they vetoed the shit out of that. We can't put that on the fucking sticker. They took it off. But you know that's what we were well, we were like so anti that shit, man. I'm sorry, I I, I missed that. My cut out right when you said that. I was curious what you just said. What the stick? On what the, was the sticker? The Girls, Sunday Machine sticker. Yeah. It was a sticker for the record, and we put no Pantera beards, no Yo oh. Boy breakdowns, you know, oh, just I, death yeah. metal from the grave, and relapse vetoed the shit out of that. Yeah, thing. I remember hearing they, something they about put the that. Sticker on there, man. Yeah. They came up with something like lucidly raw grind, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, wasn't well, what it was. at, at that time, Bill used to come up with these. Was, but you know, that's what we were doing. We were just, just wanted to do our own thing. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It certainly came across as that too, because like I said, it was very original. And even if uh, you were listening to any of the bands in Europe that were actually still playing metal at that time, you guys were just very different. And what I actually loved about your drums is um, kind of like you had that whole thing, like Witch Hunter had and uh, Tommy from Destruction. It was like you weren't trained and you didn't exactly know what was going on. But because of that, there was kind of a brilliance in your own style. You know what I mean? Nobody would play like you. So it was kind of like discombobulated, but it really worked. And if you listen to it, it like always went with the song. So it was really cool. And the fact that you were singing too. I mean, that was just crazy, man. You know, I can't I, even. Yeah, that was, one, that was, that was my idea was to take the roller coaster as far off the track we could as, without wrecking it. That was the, <laughs> that was the idea, like total madness. And, and of course, live, it got even crazier. And the guys used to say, I hope King has it, you know, come here with one of his really, really hyper nights because they'd be like, dude, you're playing so fast. We'd have a 45 or minute set. We turn into like 30 minutes because I'd be playing it so insanely fast. They're like, dude, did we even play a song that night? It was kind of like that. <laughs> you know, it was it was all it was all in the fucking uh, the progress of the band and stuff. You know, you learn from your mistakes and 
here we are 36 years later. And from that record, we're what fearless were like 24 years ago on that one. That, that was, that was a changing point. That's the one where metal maniacs started asking for interviews and fucking, we got like on people's top 10 list of the year and stuff. Not that it mattered, but I just remember all that. And I was like, you know, cool. That it's a step forward for us as far as getting out and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. I, I like to cut in for one moment, quick moment. If I, if you could hear me, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Cause I keep cutting out uh, any, but I've always noticed with the songs because I mean, the, the, I know you guys best from the demo era stuff because we used to play a lot of shows that you guys or go to a lot of your shows around birth by radiation and stuff like that. And I always liked the fact that your song sounded. <laughs> we lost you again. <laughs> the, like the drumming, the vocal patterns, the music. Uh, what's that? You got to start again. <laughs> oh, OK, One more time. I'm sorry start about again, that. John. I'm sorry about that. OK, brother. Um, fine. Yeah, no, I always thought that the songs were distinctively deceased sounding. They didn't sound like any of the other death metal bands that we were playing with, which, which I always thought was a great thing about you guys. I mean, the, you know, like the birth by radiation demo songs and stuff, or like, like you're talking about making the songs, um, I don't know, feel like the story or, or what I can. <laughs> Poor John. <laughs> when John yeah, it was basically like like streaks like streaks from is it my freezing anyway it's like streaks from the hearse or something like that i think it's like a perfect way of putting the music to the lyrics and the drums it all works together in it sounds cheesy but it's almost like an artistic way where you're you're not following the rule <laughs> That's a great shot, John. That is a That's great, great. I mean, pause. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, anyway, no, I, any I get I get what you're saying, John. I do. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, that was the thing about us that was weird. Like we weren't as heavy as most. You know, we were not down tuned or anything like that for like the guttural stuff. If yeah. We were out. Here's a perfect example. Uh, 2014, I think it was. We went over and played Keep It True. Now we were on the bill. It was Jag Panzer. It was fucking Sinner. It was all those bands. And I came on stage there and I said, I do not sing like the guy from Halloween. And we went into what we do. When the show was over, people were like coming up to me like, man, you guys were like fucking Venom. You were such a change of pace here, right? Well, then I, th I saw you a few days later, I think, at, at the Neurotic Death Fest. Were you at that one that when I was when we yeah. played that one? Okay. Yeah. I thought, remember, I saw you there. And at the end of that, after we played that one, we heard from everybody, you were the most melodic. We were like the carpenters <laughs> to that show. You see what I'm saying? We weren't like, you know, what was it? Like Pungent Stench Guy, Terrorizer, that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, like Down Tune. That's what that place was. And the guy said, well, we're going to play like all of our luck of the corpse shit and just come out there fading survival times 10 kind of shit. I said, no, nah, man, we just do what we do. You know what I'm saying? And people appreciated that. And and I know in no damn way am I comparing us to Voivod, but Voivod used to be like that. You go see shows and it would be like Creator and, and Voivod. It would be so different, but it worked. You know, we just want to be ourselves. And that's that's what I'm, I'm most proud of with the band is we've never, I don't care what year it is. I mean, you know, when we did Luck of the Corpse, I remember Doug, our original guitar player, saying, you got to sing more growl. Like, that's what everybody's doing now. And I was like, that's not me, man. I like to do the fucking shrieks. I like to become the character, the, 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 the harrowing victim in the tale. Respect. <laughs> oh, he's back. Hi, Robin. Sorry. It's okay, Robin. So anyway, um, are, any, anything else, uh, Steve? Oh, just the last thing. I was just thinking about it. Um, did you decide to sing while you played the drums because, like, you were such a fan of Triumph? Because I know you really are. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was all Gil Moore's fault. Uh, <laughs> Gil Moore's fault. Allied forces. No, what, what happened was this. Originally, I was the bass player. In the in deceased, we weren't called deceased yet. We were called Evil Axe, which is the stupidest name you'll ever hear, unless you're 13, 14 years old. That is the coolest name you'll ever hear. <laughs> but anyway, and and it was me on bass, and it was a guy named Marcel on drums, who actually ended up playing live for Atheist for a while down in Florida. And uh, it was Doug on guitar. And 
eventually Marcel stopped coming to practice and we got Mark in on second guitar and we thought, well, it would be a lot easier if I kept the beat than the bass. Well, bass is better mm -hmm. off letting that come later on because without drums, we felt like we couldn't do anything. For a while, I played on a guitar case, but then Marcel let me borrow his drum set because he got hooked up with a girl and he just didn't show up to practice anymore. That old fucking thing but uh so then I, he was like well who, you were supposed to sing man we like your lyrics man you got a cool voice you scream you do this i said i'll fucking sing and if i was to say where it came from i would the first person out of my mouth would have probably been dan dealer and as and if i'm thinking of my kid days it would have been peter chris so that's where it came from but i thought of course of everybody else from gilmore to fucking don fucking henley you know it's right. just whoever sang then but yeah I, and i just figured let's do it and it was crazy because like those first few shows with the punk rock bands there was no vocals at those shows because it was like, if you're going to play this shit and you got to get the microphone over here and all this shit, we couldn't do that then. So it was about by the sixth show. The first five shows we played were instrumental sets. And, uh, and it just, it worked. And then I got pretty goddamn good at it, man. Like I'd say about 90, no, 80, 90, 90 was when it really got good. Probably 90. And I was probably at my best till about 98. And then I started, you know, drinking a lot and fucking putting on weight and all this shit. And it wasn't like I was getting like lazy or sloppy. It wasn't that. It just, it just showed. It just, it hurt. It, it just, it wasn't as fast. It wasn't as good to me. Other people thought it was better than ever, but I didn't agree with that. But it was fun I, to I do. I, I enjoyed it. What I do that for 15, 16 years and the band's wow. around 36 now. So I've actually been doing it, not doing it longer than I was doing it now. <laughs> Wow. So like I'm gonna I'm gonna go off of that conversation mm -hmm. and and ask. I mean, having a band, as most of us know, is so difficult. And you know, you wanna like you have ideas and you have like influences and you wanna like do all of this stuff. It seems like with deceased, like you did all that, but you had to be like the the main person to like basically be the driving force where you're playing bass, doing drums, or now you're singing, you're doing this, you're doing that. Was that like on purpose just to, cause that was your passion to make this band happen come hell or high water kind of thing. You're absolutely right. It, it, it yeah. was, it was every, it was, we were all the same age. Mark was actually a year older than us. We were all having the same vision and stuff, but I just attacked it intensely. It just was everything to me. It was, it, it consumed my, it still does. Even now. Yeah. At I mean, everything old, has still been consumed like, my days. Like, it seems it just, like and I mean, I just, without you, obviously I don't, there would be no deceased, like in my opinion. And I would assume everybody else. They were just like, they, like, all the band, all the guys that have ever been in the band are like, dude, you're so crazy and over the top. You've got to be the fucking leader, the front man and all this stuff. Even no, though, you know, great, half like, of them came later. It's just, it's, you know, I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm good at entertaining, I think, for the most part. And it's, <laughs> you it's are, fun. You're a great entertainer, for sure. Like, <laughs> well, thank 100%. <laughs> but it's, and, and it's, 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 it, it was, it was cool to do all that. And I'm still write all the lyrics. I still arrange every deceased song comes through me. It's just what I do. It's, it's, it's my calling, you know. And, I mean, I'm, I just, I'm proud just, of it. It's just amazing. Like through all these years, I mean, you went like bass and, oh, well, now we need a drummer. No, now I'm going to play drums because that's what we need with the band. And now, oh, wait, now we need a singer. I'm going to do that now. And you're like, it's like, oh my God. Because you have to. <laughs> it's like, because you have to. It's like, you're like, it's awesome. That, that day where I first sang for Deceased was so incredible for me because how it happened was, I had my other band, October 31, and we couldn't, I didn't want to sing for that. I just wanted to play drums. I was like, I want to be in a band where I can just play my drums and get really crazy and be a heavy metal drummer for this band. But we couldn't find anybody that would, that could do it. So I sang on the first demo, then I sang on the record and we didn't play live. We found a guy to sing. He couldn't sing. He was worse than me as a singer, singer. And, but he was a fun front man for what he was. And then he didn't want to do it anymore. Then we got a guy that could sing his ass off, but he was the most boring front man ever. And it, cause this guy was soaring. I mean, he was like Jag Panzer, Jeff Tate type of guy. And he was good. Cause I always wanted to write these melodic parts, like a triumph or something like that, that were memorable. Cause I love that stuff, but he didn't want to do it after a couple of shows. So it came back to me. And then the guy said, but you gotta be out front, man, because you, man, you're just a fun fun entertainer they're like be like ozzy or bon scott where you're not a great singer but you're a fun entertainer so i'm like oh fucking k <laughs> so the first time i ever went out and sang for october 31 was at vakken in front of 22,000 people wow. and I went on the first time, it was the first time the drummer dave played drums for us and we went up there and I, after it was done i'm like man i fucking love this so we went back and i said you know what maybe this will work in deceased too and so 
Dave, uh, Dave said, you know, if you want me to play drums for Deceased, I'd love to because that's my shit. I love to play fast. He came over, and here we go again. The first time Deceased ever played live was at Vakken with me singing. And that was <laughs> the next year because the guy at Vakken, the leader guy, whatever his name is, he was like, oh, man, I loved you. You reminded me of Ozzy Osbourne. There's the fucking Ozzy Osbourne. Again. <laughs> and, he, and he's like, I want you to, you have another band you can play next year. And he put us on the main stage and all this. And we went out there and played. And the funnest thing was not having my butt cheeks stuck to a drum stool the whole because all night i'm you know you're back there and you want to get up run around and it's probably best it's probably best that it didn't happen until i was 35 <laughs> years old 35 years old or 34 years old that i wasn't out front because you know i i know i know john you know the most probably back in the day that probably wouldn't have been a good thing to have me in the front at a lot of those shows <laughs> you know what i'm saying back in the day especially the g willikers day. you were enough a hellraiser for being in the back but but and it was it, it was cool and I just said man I should have been doing this all along but then you think like Robin said yeah. you got you got to do what you got to do to get to where you need to be awesome yeah totally uh, yeah I told <laughs> I, 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 okay, fuck I don't it. see John just keep going here. Robin <laughs> no somebody else wants to go that's fine i just was like no well why don't you why don't you finish up robin might as well oh well i was just gonna say i mean it's just it's crazy but it is like you bring up all that and like if you go back and read my favorite line that i read it's like um where is it i gotta find it now ah, but it's something like because you brought it up and you're like we do you know uh our goal is to out thrash slayer like, that was it. Like, that I was it, that. man. That's. I mean, I when mean, I met all these guys like, at concerts, that's at the beginning of your career, so that's even more amazing. Like it wasn't just, re, you know, it was like we're gonna be out thrash you, and that's it. You know, when Mark when Mark met us, we bullshitted him. I, I, I said, dude, we let off bombs like Venom. We're faster than Slayer and Metallica. You know, the bands of the day, and we're just we're faster. We're fucking crazier than Merciful Fate. We're evil or the Merciful Fate, whatever it was. And I'm just and he knew I was bullshitting him, but he knew there was something there. There was a spirit. And we, I was uh we were at we were, I met him at a Twisted Sister Queensryche concert at a bar. This was a bar. This was Queensryche was on their EP and Twisted Sister was on You Can't Stop Rock and Roll in a bar. And I met him and I just I talked him into wanting to be in the band. And then by the time he got to the band, came to the band, Doug had took our guitar lessons. I, he'd only been playing a year and he learned like Witching Hour from Venom and I think early stuff he learned was like Feel the Fire from Overkill, things like that. But Mark came in there and he could play the entire all the leads included on Hello Waits. And all that stuff he was playing, Break the Chain from Raven, which was a crazy riff for the time. And I was I was the worst of the batch. I you know, I was like on bass and I just sucked. I mean, I was terrible. And and then they were like, Well, go to drums, man. You're you know, you probably got a lot of craziness. You're you're hyper as shit, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And we found a drum set in my little brother's bedroom, and they didn't have a floor a bass drum. So I took the floor tom, turned it sideways, put a pedal on it, and we went like that. We did our first rehearsal was I, it was like January of 85 was our first rehearsal. But we'd already been writing songs in 84. We had like this, we didn't know which way we were going to go. I have some tapes somewhere. We have a song called, um, it was called The Witch's End. And it was like Merciful Fate. I was singing high like King Diamond on it. Then we had another one. It was like called Terror Inside the Coffin, which was kind of like Hellhammer, where it was that Ooh, ah, kind of vocal. And then I was like, <laughs> you know, this ain't working for me either. And then I started writing all these songs and then, Early on, Marcel, this is probably why I did a lot of things, Robin, while you were saying, like, I had to do it all. Marcel come to practice. He'd be like, man, I just wrote this song, man. It's called Choke on Chains, man. You ready to do Choke on Chains? And I was like, Choke on Chains? What the fuck is that? And, you know, and he, he, he just didn't get it. And then, and then we were like, try, I started putting weird words together, which is another thing. I'm had Those early days of the deceased titles were Funeral of Gore. You know, now it sounds predictable. But back then it was twisting words, you know, things like that. Deformed tomorrows, blah, blah, blah. Birth by radiation, just words like that. And I just said, man, I'm starting to learn this shit. And the lyrics were your typical grave robin, end of the world horse shit. Nothing stood out at all, but it was just, it was a start. Awesome. That was great. I, like it. I guess we all thrashed cool. Slayer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, well, I guess if you could hear me out there, um, you can go with Ralph, I guess. Why not? All right. Uh, going back to the beginning of this episode, John was mentioning how outspoken Kingsley is in interviews and stuff. And I always just love that. Like, to hear 
hear any, read any of his interviews, it's always like you're in a bar with him, just bullshit, and then he don't care who the fuck's hearing anything, and that's the best. And even like I don't agree with everything. I know he doesn't like Celtic Frost and you know certain bands that you're going to disagree with, but that's how it would be if you were hanging out at a bar talking to him, and it, it's just great hearing that honesty from him, you know. So. I just wanted to say that. I like right the away. fast. I like the fast songs by Celtic Frost. <laughs> I just never could get the slow ones. I never liked the ooh. <laughs> it was too groovy when it was slow for me. But you know, like um, what was the one on there I love so much? The, the last one what was that not uh, fucking nocturnal. What was the fucking wind? Winds? I haven't heard it in so long. Morbid tale. Nocturnal winds. Go back to it. That's it, right? <laughs> the real fast one. That's the one I like. I like Hellhammer. I like Crucifixion, especially from the Metal Massacre record. It was just, it was just people would just ask questions. They'd be like, oh, I don't like this. And most of the stuff with Celtic Frost came later when I thought they tried to do all this avant-garde stuff. And I just thought they weren't, they weren't there yet. They just weren't ready to get that. But yeah, you know, being honest is just, like I said earlier, it's just the way to be. I mean, well, it, ain't, it ain't to hurt nobody's feelings. It ain't to think I'm cooler or trying to be douchey either. It's just fucking, it is what it is. If you ask, okay. Do you, do you like to sell? Too. That's fine. You don't have to like my mom or my family <laughs> or my car or my wife or me. Doesn't matter. I'm not, I mean, we're like John said, we're, it's all, it's all, it's how you present yourself, man. And yeah. when I was drinking, it could get pretty fucking shitty. <laughs> <laughs> one, one quite, while we're on Celtic Frost, did, were you a fan of their cover of Mexican radio? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> honestly, and, honestly and truly, I don't really even like the original from Wall of Voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Ralph. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I bet it's just great how he got the balls to, to say it and not give a shit that uh, somebody in the scene is going to have a problem with it or whatever. He, no one's going to confront him about it, and uh, he don't give a fuck. And that, that's always been a refreshing thing in interviews. So many bands don't have the balls to speak up and, and say what they really feel. So I always love that about, about Kingsley. And uh, I just think they're one of the most original bands. I think they're so underrated that because... Um, I think one of the problems is that people couldn't categorize them because they have so many different influences in one. I mean, the early days were real death metal, but as you started putting the albums out, it just, it just progressed and you got so many different, like you'll hear, like Levin said, um, like you'll hear a bit of Iron Maiden here and then your vocals remind me so much of Cronus at times and uh, just, a, just a lot of that stuff from that era. And I, I just, love everything that you've done on vinyl and on TV. And uh, I don't know if you want to go into favorite albums. Uh, uh, Surreal Overdose was my favorite album. And uh, I gave you the thumbs up, man. That's the black sheep of our discography. I love that. It's my second favorite deceased record, man. I love it. It's, it's pummeling all the way through. It's like the most straight up thrashing album, I think, from you. And uh, I love Fearless Dead Machine, Undead Machines. Uh, I love Death Metal from the Grave. Oh, yeah, I got CDs to put up and stuff. Uh, I got one of the thousand copies. Yeah, you do, man. That's old school right there. That's Paul Folk days, man. Exterminance. Last World Records. Number 609 I got. Um, <laughs> right on. Uh, that's great. Just having the, all the demo stuff. It, it's so great to go back to that era. Even though the production had on a lot of stuff, it's it just... It's it's awesome going back and I just listened to all that stuff again and I went on YouTube and even just like listened to the full demos of everything just to go back and refresh on all that stuff and it was great man you guys were really heavy and more death metal at the time you could kind of easily be considered death metal back then but then once the album started coming out after Luck of the Corpse it started becoming more thrash and traditional metal and death and you were just on the line of of so many different genres that like you know that's what it was hard to categorize and to me that's one of the best things you could say about a band when you you don't know where to put them and that means that they're doing something original and uh you know supernatural addiction i got reagan over here holding the vinyl i don't know if you can see that but um that's a great one and uh blueprints of madness for Madness was always one of my favorite ones and Ghostly White too. I love the last album and uh, I got the I got the cover album on the way coming from Amazon right now. Hey, right on. But, uh, I would do that. I mean, I, you know, you've obviously been there for a long, 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 long time, man. 
definitely appreciate it. I mean, the band, I mean, I'm not going to take the credit. We all, the, the whole band, I mean, for so long, it was me, Mark, Mike, and Les. That's the one that everybody calls the classic lineup. And we did it for a long time. And it was the thing that I think worked the best was we were just four, just literally four goofy guys that got together in Virginia of all places. And we just loved what we loved. You know, Les loved his cryptic slaughter and his accused. And I loved my, I loved, you know, all my the metal and things too. But I also loved my Pat Benatar and my fucking Blondie. And then you had Mark Adams and he was Judas Priest maniac. There's a lot of crossovers, had Mike, <laughs> What's There's that? a lot of crossover vibe in the early stuff too. I love the the crossover vibe that I get from it. Absolutely, you know. And, and that was that was Doug, and I can't forget Doug Souther. He was there at the start. He was the one that did those demo stuff. And he, you know, the luck of the, the corpse material is basically him. Mike starts at thirteen, frightened souls, but just that lineup. It was just it was just so awkward because we'd go out and you know, Mark and Mike always had the the uh, jean jackets, you know, and the. The, the denim and leather kind of thing. And they were kind of like the, the twins that people would say all the time. And, and, you know, they lived it. And we'd get around some people, not, not a lot of people, but some people would just wear that stuff. And you could, you know, I, I have a saying, know your patches, where it's like these people, they're like, I've had guys come up, I'm like, what's your favorite Judas Priest song? And they're literally telling me their favorite song is British Steel. I'm like, not album, <laughs> song. It's like, yeah, British Steel. And I'm thinking, you know, what the fuck? You know, this is weird to me. <laughs> and things like that. But these guys, they, they, they lived it. I mean, you know, we they... We just lived in Virginia, and it was just, it was awkward, it was weird, it was neat, you know, it was just, I think it was our surroundings that made a lot of that just be itself, too, besides the fact, I mean, Mike Smith, man, he's he's got, in my in my musical days, he's the best riff writer I've ever been around, I mean, this guy can come up with some amazing melodies, ghostly white, all this stuff, he just comes in and practice handfuls of the shit and mark adams in his day man like the best lead studio player i've ever been with and me and less less and less than me are like the tail gunners you know we kind of sit back a little bit more almost like a punk rhythm section where you know we're not the world's best drummer or worst our best bass player but it, it works amongst these guys those two are definitely more talented players than we are and i just think it all kind of came together and obviously you know they've been out, out of live Mike hasn't played live since 2006 and Mark left the band in 2007 and we've done stuff like Shane came in big boy vod freak loved his band Biovore came right in longtime friend like a family and you know and you know we could talk about this too is you, you go 36 years people people die people get married people get divorced people have houses people lose houses people get sick you know it all it's all part of it and you either let it go and you move on to something else but like like Robin was saying before Deceased is, is my life, man. I mean, I know that sounds funny to say it that way, but deceased is my life. It's it's something I, I if somebody wants to walk away, that's fine. But I mean, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I, you know, I, I could, I feel right now at 53, I can go till I'm 75 doing this, man. Another 22 years, you know, I feel fucking good. I feel like, you know, I'm totally into what we're doing. You know, we're working on it. We got a new record. We're going to start work, you know, writing soon. Mike is actually retiring soon. He, he's a government guy. He's been living overseas for quite some time. And that's quite a, the reason of the last two records have been so far apart was because of that. But he's actually retiring in October and coming back to America. He doesn't have to work anymore his whole life, man. He wants to put together two deceased albums in a shorter amount of time to make up for the two that took 10 years to make. But we're working the next record's called Children of the Morgue. And it, it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be deceased 110 percent it's going to be our fucking all and whoever's involved down the line it's going to be fucking cool man and i and I'm, I'm happy to know i have that in my life i don't do drugs i don't fool around i don't smoke cigarettes i don't have a fucking can of beer uh, beer cans here in the trash can next to me man i just live for fucking music and you know and that it wasn't always that way i used to be a fuck up and a drunk and a, and all that kind of shit there's a difference between a th easy drinker and all that kind of shit i don't knock nobody for what they do i just know for me everything i do has got to be fucking times 100 and that's not a good thing for some of what i was doing so i take it out on my music man <laughs> and i you know and that's how we're going to that's how we're going to be going forward man and i and i definitely thank you from the bottom of my heart dude for the long time support man and you, you're sitting here talking knowing the records and stuff it means a lot dude it really does um, you, you came to, you know, Rock Fantasies, uh, the Rock Fantasy Files is the name of the show, and Rock Fantasy uh, had two clubs back in the 80s that were right around the corner from Rock Fantasy, and one of them was the Rock Palace, and I bring it up to you really quickly before, I remember seeing you and Les, and maybe the other guys were there too, but I remember you and Les were at the Rock Palace show with Cynic, Malevolent, Creation, and Primeval, and, um, then you played with Primeval there. Yeah, and we got pictures from that. The class, the class was another club that we had 
and that was a little later on, and you played with um, All Out War, Nocturnal, Deceased, and Morpheus Descends. I don't know if you remember coming up for that show. But, I do. Uh, that was, I heard some that of that. Was, it sort of fell out for a second. Day, but I hear Morpheus Descends. But old, old man, I love Prime Evil, man. I mean, I was best with um, with Mary the most back then. Uh, what was it? Basis Banker Banger? <laughs> Am I right, yeah. John? Basis Banker Banger? Yeah, Mary's great. That was her. That was she's, her thing, so, you know. And she's so metal; it's ridiculous. Absolutely, and I love that. I love, they were they were one of the. They were, I think they were the first band we brought down out of state. I mean, they're, from back then that we brought down, we got in really good with them. You know, they're just good people. They're one of the and best. We like going up there, and when we played that Rock Palace with them, boy, I tell you what, boy, that was a hard crowd. It was like playing with Twisted Sister, man. <laughs> they're fucking crowd, like get off, get fuck you. Put <laughs> people up there. He sucks. They were fuck like our, you. they were like our hometown Slayer band. They you know, do. They were, like, they were they, people love them like a like a reptile, man. <laughs> But it was always it was always fun, dude. That that night, if Mark was here, Chainsaw, that was the night I think Mike Anderson's. We got our car. Something happened with our car, and I think that's the one where we had to we it broke down, and he got the car. We all lifted the car up onto a fire hydrant to get it jacked up off the ground, and uh, something with the oil pan. And um, the our, one guy, one of our roadies, was a car buff. He took a pack of bubble yum and sealed it to get us back to Virginia. Something happened that night with the van too. That's a Mark. That's a Mark Chainsaw thing. He would remember that more so than me. But I rem- that was a great time, man. But I do remember, man. They were like, "Fuck you, Prime Evil. Fuck off, dude." <laughs> <laughs> I'm cool. With One that. other <laughs> real memorable show that I remember was uh, when you played the March Metal Meltdown. I got a picture of me and my wife hanging out with Les, drinking it up from 1999. Awesome. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the I fucking. Think you have a funny, I call him Duck Sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a funny story about that day uh, when you played the March Metal Meltdown. Something about drunk craziness that went on. What what? Okay, that was the what was that the? <laughs> now I see Robin like smiling like yeah, let's go with that one. Uh, what was that one? Uh, nineteen? You say nineteen ninety nine? It's about yeah. then, yeah. Who, what was the big bands? If you if you tell me the bands, I'll remember the story. Was is that the one where Man of War played? Was it you talking about? Is that Asbury yeah, Man, Park? Yeah, Man of War, Raven, uh, Cider played. There were so many old school bands. I, I was uh, kicked. I was kicked out of that one. Yeah. I had Lucy that's, that's, and Iris carried me out of that one. I got kicked out of that one. I was I was shit drunk. I went by there was it was a hotel outside that thing, and I ripped the painting off from behind the fucking the the desk, and they kicked me out of there. And I think that's the one where relapse tried to accuse uh, i think it was deceased or mortician or both of stealing their safe somebody stole the safe out of their room it wasn't us all we did was steal some frozen pizzas out of the kitchen <laughs> but uh all that dude i was kicked out for sure man i i was I, it was a big time and we had to play i think that's the one we we left and we, we played the new england thing was the next day we had that same weekend i think they both crisscrossed that time and um, we went up to that thing. And we just got away from that. And we tried to come back on after the New England thing, to come back down and, and hang with people on Saturday. But those those Jack Koshik events, man, woo. <laughs> they were always, uh, they were an event. I mean, you'd show up, oh, yeah, don't worry about nothing. It's there. You get over there and it'd be one piece drum set, you know. I'm sure yeah. you dealt with it too, John. <laughs> it was just like, okay, well, okay, what? Well, no, I thought you said don't bring guitar heads. I thought you blah, 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 and all that stuff. But it was it, all it was was a party, man. It was a fucking party, man. And I loved it. That That's also the one where my other band, October 31, played, I think. And that's where Saxon, there was the room with all the old heavy metal bands played. I guess that man award might have been the other night. Yeah. But I know it was, I know there was like one where it was like Riot, Anvil, Blood Feast, Slaughterhouse, all played in a row. Whiplash, too, and, and Anvil. And we played, and Saxon was up in the balcony of that one other room watching us put, sing Power and the Glory, and that was fucking cool. Remember that? Remember that other room had the balcony? It was kind of like a movie theater room. That's the right place. Yeah. That's the one by the beach, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's where all the old school bands played. It was like the Raven and uh, Man yeah. of War. Jackson, yes. I, if I if, man, I wish I had. I just put the box away. I have pictures from all that Raven and all that shit. That was that was great times, man. But yeah, I could see that picture you showed Alas. He used to turn red when he drank, man. He get so fucking yeah. beat red, man. Be like, you all right, man? He like, I'm fucked up, man. I'm fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. He's he lives in Texas now, but he's still 100 percent in deceased, man. He just lives in Texas. Yeah, my last thing would just be Ellie's dementia is probably my favorite song. It's just so memorable. I love the video. 
back in the day. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. I like that you said that because that I wrote that one. That's that's 90 percent of that's mine. The other guys did contribute, but that was my tune. It was a little bit different for the record, and we were so caught up in the Blair Witch that we had to do that song. We loved that movie when it came out. We like five times the very first weekend before it even hit the major markets. We were at the art house to see this fucking thing, and we never played that live. We always got the intro at some of our shows later on to start the show. That they never well it wasn't they it was dave was like man that's that goddamn drum beat i don't know how many times you play it in a row but i like it my my son says it's the worst to see song ever he hates it that so <laughs> i'll be i'm gonna use that as a sample we play live i'm gonna put you over the fucking pa brother <laughs> 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 thanks man seriously cheers brother appreciate it ralph uh awesome i was gonna say something but i keep feeling like i'm cutting out so i don't even want to bother because no one will be able to hear it well, but- all right man <laughs> you're not gonna, you're not gonna you're good job. Well, okay well i w- what i wanted to say was the early like there was it was stated that you know i guess back in the early days that it was kind of death metal but then death metal got all like you know low vocally and just you know guttural and stuff like that but i uh... <laughs> we lost you he almost got it out you almost got so it now John. it's just weird because God damn it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it was okay. all guttural. Well, anyway, but... yeah, it was, all, it was all guttural. But at the time, you know, death metal was still being created and stuff. It, was, it only just happened to go to a kind of that one area of where it got, got trendy, I guess, to be more guttural, to try to be the fastest and the heaviest and stuff like that. But to me, a lot of the other bands like Ripping Corpse, Revenant, um, I don't know, uh, you know, Demolition Hammer, whatever you want to say. They were all kind of all borderline death metal. And Deceased was kind of in that area too, I thought, where it was like, yeah, it just agree. it just wasn't as low as, you know, say what we were doing with Incantation or, I don't know, Gorephobia or something. But it didn't make it any less death metal. It's like, like a band like Macabre is still death metal. It's, it's yeah, they're right. their own thing. But to me, it's still death metal. It's just that I think at a certain point, people got tunnel vision into what death metal was. And I, and I, it just makes me think, think like, like what was annoyed or resentful because it was, to me, it was kind of weird that that happened. Did you hear me at all? I mean, I, I, what you just said makes perfect sense. I mean, I like the fact that it was all, it wasn't the same damn thing over and over, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, when we play with bands now and it's like they come out and it's like, all right, deceased, they're death metal, you know, whatever they put on the flyer now, legendary death metal from the grave. They're expecting to come out and we get 10 bands that sound like, I'd rather hear something that's totally yeah. not that. For example, we went out, we played at, um, at the um, Whiskey A Go Go in California and this band came on stage and it was literally a little Asian girl with a hula hoop and two two strings on her guitar, and she was playing, and it was like the B-52s. And I'm like, how in the fuck is this on the show with us? This is crazy. But I was like, <laughs> it was different enough to like, okay, if even if I don't like it or it's not good or whatever you want to say, it's not the same fucking repetitive all night. Yes. And afterwards, I said, well, how'd you guys get on? And of course, you know this as much as I do. They were like, we just paid a bunch of money, and they put us on whatever show they feel like putting us on. So they paid to play, which I can't stand. But uh, that that was what was cool. Like and when we play these bands, it's like, okay, tonight it's going to be inverted anus or, you know, Jesus is <laughs> fucking, you know, it's, you get, you know where I'm at. Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. Many more of those type of bands than I have. And uh, <laughs> I got nothing against them. And it's just, it's just, it's nice to mix it up. Cause I mean, I don't care what anybody says to hear the same idea or I close to the same ideas repeatedly all night. Again, we're back to the, um, the keep it true thing. They were like, thanks. You just stood out a little bit as something a little bit different. Whether you liked it or not doesn't matter. It's just, it's just giving it your approach. And with death metal, like you said, macabre, you know, you had, you had a rigor mortis, you know, that was more like a speed metal thrash thing. Those guys came with you. So pinch later aggression, you got Dennis yeah. and they, they were, they were doing some crazy shit. Metal slaughter. I wouldn't oh, yeah. say that's death metal, but it's goddamn pretty fucking ugly heavy. It's goddamn Very cool. inspirational. Just, just, just all around the world. And you know, and you know this too. It also locations, you know, the California thing was different from the East Coast, the European, the Canadian. It was all its own thing. Florida was my least favorite stuff. And I know most people love that the most. To me, that was the stuff I just didn't get the most for the most part. 
there was some exceptions. I always, you know, some of the lesser bands down there, like uh, Darth Vader's Church and stuff like that. Like, oh, I yeah, I forgot those, about them. Yeah, some of those records back then, they were neat. And, you know, and, and those bands, they just did what they did. But I, I agree with what you said, man. It was neat to do something just a little different. And we weren't even trying to do something different. We were just trying to be ourselves. It wasn't like, no, 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 that's been done. Let's do this. It wasn't well, being, even a thought in our head. Being metal is about being yourself anyway. That's what the exactly. whole being metal bottom being line metal. to it. It's about being rebellious, you know, not following the trends. But Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, brother. Okay, well, I'm going to bring it over to Denny before I cut out again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> The 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 or nicest Kenny Rogers, part, you're up. The <laughs> nicest part about when you cut off is that the the the, the video is trying to catch up to your voice <laughs> after, and then like you're moving like super fast. It's fucking amazing. I could watch that all night. Um, awesome. <laughs> so um, I guess like um, for me like deceased like I I I heard about. Um, I heard about the band after I actually met uh, King Fowley in person. Um, I met him at that Cro-Mags Venom Voivod show, but I was introduced like, and I think the person who introduced me to you was one of the guy, I think it's Piggy from Voivod. Um, but like, I, I, I met like 15 guys that night. They're like, you know, like uh, I met like, you know, Monty Connor and Tom Don K and Scott Givens and, and, uh, Fucking Boy and all those guys, right? So, um, but anyway, it was New York. It was fucking crazy. Chromax was insane. Uh, Venom sucked, but whatever. Um, but like um, the person who like uh, gave me the uh, Bird by Radiation demo was actually Scott Givens because Scott Givens was originally from Maine. But he was going to school in Virginia or somewhere down there. No, he went, actually, it might even been like Alabama or I don't know, somewhere south. Uh, and he, he's the one who gave me, he came, came to Montreal to see Aggression and he gave me the demo. So that's the first time that I, I, I heard the band. Um, and then um, once like, uh, once Aggression folded, um, I got into like a lot of trouble where music was not a always available to me. Like um, I was not able to listen to new bands and things like that. So um, then I moved to Florida. <laughs> uh, my dad, my dad's American uh, and, and he was living in Hallandale uh, just outside of Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so I moved there to kind of like get my shit together and, um, and that's where I started to like get into like, you know, you're talking about like 91, like starting to like, uh, you know, like I think at that time, like a bunch of bands came out like Cathedral and, and, and uh, fucking like uh, Entomb and, and like. That was the even, big era craze. Right. Like, but even like, even though it was supposed to be a grunge, like uh, Alice in Chains and all that shit coming out, like. To me, like, I always think of that era as the birth of, like, amazing bands. Um, and, and and Disease was one of them, similar to Incantation and all that. Like, um, I, I, I just, like, I went to, like, Tower Records and, like, uh, so there was another record store in, like, South Florida. I forgot the name of it, but. What, the big, the metal know, one, Aces Records? Aces. The yes, Aces yes. was in Tampa. Aces was in Tampa. Tampa. No, peaches not the on the on the uh, on the East Coast. There was one. Yeah, like, peaches, uh, Uncle Sam's. Um, the Uncle Sam. But anyway, I used to go in there, and then you know, like they would have like a death metal, like metal section, and then you could get like brute, like brutal truth, and all that shit, and the Morbid Angel, and, and you know, like DSI and all that. But like they also had like all kind of different, like a lot of relapse band, right? And uh, and like in the magazine back then, like Relapse used to have like these little ads with like six records on them. And you, you know, like, okay, I'm going to grab all six. Right. And that's where like, but I never knew like that the guy I met at the Pro Mag show was the same dude that was in that band. Like to me, there was no, because I think when we met, uh, uh, King Fowley talked to me about like Mad Butcher, Evil Axe, and then you know, you just changed the name to Deceased. Um, 
and and I remember having the conversation. Uh, then I remember getting my air pulled by like fucking like five skin at and just be thrown in the fucking like <laughs> in in the mosh pit. But um, uh, so this is this is where it started. And like um, you know, like I I always like to absorb new music, regardless if it's like prog rock or like metal or any type of music. I I'm always been like the guy at the record store going to the vinyls, looking at the cover and trying to find new music. Now with like Spotify and like, uh, uh, you know, YouTube and all that, like I just like absorb a lot of new music all day when I'm working, I'm trying to listen to, to new albums by Ben I used to like, or uh, uh, not Ben I used to listen to and then try to see the new thing. So, and I was telling that to King earlier today, like, um, you know, I can't even believe that Ghostly White was released three years ago. Like to me, it's like a new album. But then when I'm like, oh yeah, that was in 2018. And I'm like, holy shit, that seems like so long ago. Um, and that's the one that I listen to the most right now because every deceased album has a different vibe. Um, you know, like um, when I listen to like the Blueprints of Madness, to me, it's closer to aggression and vibe. There's a lot of like hardcore punk into it. Um, and I can hear like, you know, like I can hear like that GBH agnostic front vibe in there somewhere, like just more hardcore. And then like another, like uh, Lock of the Corpse is definitely more like, more like death metal. Like if you want to like compare, but I see like, a, and that's it. I think that's for me, like as a listener, that's where I, I, I'm trying to put myself in your head and, and be like, okay, he's releasing a new album he doesn't have no uh there's no like rules he just fucking go with whatever he wants and then this is what comes out like the as a band so as a listener it's interesting because i I, i'll never know what to expect it's always going to be in the same area of like you know like it's not going to be like super far but it's different if you're like listen to metal a lot like all of you guys do you can hear the differences and that's what's fucking amazing like Ghostly White, I love the, the, the fucking melody of the solos uh, behind everything that's going on. It's got like, um, it's got a bit of a Death Tour 666 vibe, a little bit like in, in the echo of the, the soloing, but like the, the, the melodies and everything is just, it's just like so mind blowing with, with the, the vocals on top of it and all that. So, but like, that was one of my questions. Like you answered already like six questions I had by just talking with uh, Steve and, and Ralph, but like, um, how do you like, like when you have like a, a, a concept, like now you just said that the next album will call, will be called Children of the Moor. Children of the Morgue. Of the Morgue, okay. So Children of the Morgue. Children that so... grew up at the Moors. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like I was like, is this what hey. you're talking about? One but, of them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so like, Actually, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, like, how how do you like when you go into it? Do you have like a concept always, or like do you just get you just like hey, let's get a bunch of songs and just lay them down and see how they're gonna sound once we do pre prod, or how do you how do you go about it? Well. The songwriting has really been me and Mike Smith for the most part, with a little bit of Shane in the last few records. Like me, like if you go back to Ghostly White, me and Shane actually wrote Endless Well from the last record. That was one where Mike was away and we just wrote this song. We were like, let's just see how it goes when you and me tried something. And it came out nice. Uh, it was really cool. And then that'll continue on with his ideas. But for the most part, all the way back to like Fearless, uh, most of it's been me and Mike. We get together before back then when Mark and Les would come in the room and we would just get these ideas. And how I used to tell Mike was for that one exact, going back to Fearless, it was a concept record. He wanted to get the demo stuff done with the storyline, but the storyline told in a better way than it was when I was a fucking 86, 87, 88 guy, you know, it was a little older and all that. So I would say, well, this one's called Graphic Repulsion, okay? And this one is the part of the story that this is the gore of the movie. This is the graphic repulsion, it's the visuals. This isn't the deep emotional, uh, for example, like the silent creature was the slow moving, but brooding coming at you 
attack song. You know, that silent creature opened up the record. It gave you, you wanted to be something that was like coming at you. Then you had the charge of Feral Sunday Machines, which all systems go, bam, and you're out there. So I gave them these vibes beyond science or mysterious research. They were more, they were more like mysterious. They were like, they wanted it to have like these creepy crawly kind of parts where like the, the music was more like this on a, working on the screen like that or instead of just da, 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 da. the graphic compulsions for example it was supposed to be fast in your face just just all gore and that kind of song moving forward as we went like i said supernatural is my favorite which actually followed fearless that's the one where i said well look there's, there's gonna be a lot of songs about things i grew up with movies i loved stories blah 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 and that was easy for him to go off of all the guys because you could you could go and watch it and see it like i was like this one's about trilogy of terror doll for example Kurt, the doll with the spirit and they could watch it and they could get an idea and vibes in their head so that's why that one to me worked a little bit more so than most of them getting up to like ghostly white or something like that i would give them titles i would say you know i want something like this i give them an example for example mrs allardyce the first song on the record that was actually going to be was going to be ellie's dementia on supernatural addiction it was the original working title but when we got so caught up in the fucking blair witch all those years ago we said ellie's dementia we're going to write about the Blair Witch." i kept that because i said hey in about 20 years which it almost was 20 years i'm going to come back and go to more of these things because one of my favorite things of my life is growing up as a kid my mother taking me to see every one of these fucking movies the children fucking blood beach fucking whatever we're going to sit here and talk about okay and it included burn offerings let's scare jessica to death all these ones that are on ghostly white so blood i beat. would tell mike this is what was going to happen here and mike would come in with these wrists and i'm just like man this is so emotional you've got this down so good and mike to me most of mike's stuff his leads included very merciful fate i mean that's just the, the classic merciful fate for us and then, then you put the snarl of venom from me Kronos is my leader for that type of shit because the thing I love about that, the most death model I don't get vocally is the pronunciation of the words. I need to, be, every word's got to be fucking felt and heard. It's got to be felt and heard. And uh, that's how we write the songs. I mean, that's just how it's been. And Michael brings something and be like, oh, a little bit more like this if it's all for, yeah, you got it. And we, we'll, we'll disagree. We have some fucking knock it down drag outs at times. There was a riff on the last record, um, actually Surreal Overdose, where he wanted to do a riff that was supposed to be like new wave of British heavy metal. He was thinking like, he's like, yeah, here's the diamond head part. And I was like, man, that's DRI, dude. I'm speeding that up. That's going to go fast. And we fucking fought, man, verbally <laughs> in the room as hard as we could, you know? And it's just, that's part of it. But we always, we we're not, of course, we're not even in league with people under these guys, but we always call ourselves the Lennon and McCartney. And I get to be McCartney because I'm left-handed. So, but that's just our thing with me and him. And I'm, you know, and like I said, we, we talk via Facebook right now because he's overseas, but we're talking about the next record and ideas and stuff. And um, it's going to be a very dark record. And one of my favorite things as we've progressed as a band is the lyrics. The lyrics have gotten so much better, more creative, thought out, deeper. And I like the, I like the realistic stuff more than the fiction stuff. It, it's, it's more scary to me in my own mind because the stuff I'm writing about really happens. Alzheimer's disease being one of the subjects and things like that. That's the real horrors of the world to me. It's more so than, you know, the creepy ghost in the over on the other side of the yeah. room. That's fun to think about and hope there's supernatural and this and that. But it's the stuff that you're living and seeing and watching friends, whatever on TV, just just the, the really happening. That's what gets to me the most. And that's what stuff like Children of the Morgue is going to take us to. Because some people are like, oh, man, it's going to be these kids, right? And they're bloody and they eat people, right? I'm like, no, it's not going to be that at all, you know? It's going to be fucking, we're, we're all children of the morgue because we all, in the end, we all die. That's basically where the children of the morgue comes from. We're children of the morgue. We're born for the morgue. It's like the Maiden lyric, or many other people have said it. As soon as you're born, you're dying, you know? So that's like where it's going to come from. And they have to pull from the, their guitars or whatever hell the hell we write these songs, how this works. And then I'll arrange it. I'll move it around. I'll get the emotions of the lyrics to fit the parts and things like that. And that's just how we work. You know, it, it, for the most part, it works. I mean, I'm really proud of some of the stuff, like on the last record, the germ of distorted lore, that's almost a 14 minute song. And I don't yeah. think it gets boring. I don't think it's too long or, and we sure as hell didn't just play a riff 50 times to make it 14 minutes long, but we also didn't want to throw 87 riffs in there to make it just a hundred riffs that don't go nowhere. Yeah. And it's important to me. One of the things with the cease, one of the most important things is this is my pop sensibility coming in. I don't care if it's, kiss or slayer or napalm death or incantation or anything in between if it's not memorable 
then it goes nowhere. I need a hook. I need a hook in the riffs. I need a chorus. I need something. I need something to make me want to hear it again. Because so many records and death metals, especially the Gurr stuff for me, is very fucking famous for just uh, song two, uh, <laughs> song three. Uh, and I'm just, I'm like, man, there's nothing there. You can respect the plane. You can respect the, the, the stamina of the drummer. You can respect, God, that guy can scream his guts out. But I need a song, man. I'm just, I'm from the school of songs, man. I and that's agree. Where, and now nothing's we're back wrong with that. Time. I agree, I agree back to 100% triumph. with everything you're saying right there. Mm -hmm. the I, that, and that brings me back to that triumph, you know? There's nothing, if there's no hook, I can't, I'm like, what is that? It just, it just goes by you, and you know, and some people are fine with that, but I mean, and that's just the world of music. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of music from the 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. 70s, 80s, but as the 90s came in, it just started, it seemed like the whole world outside of my genre and things I love too, the, the songwriting just changed. It lost the rock and roll formula. It lost the verses. It lost the choruses and things. They deleted even solos. It didn't necessarily be a guitar solo. It could be a keyboard solo or a violin solo, anything. You can go to Kansas, whatever you want to go to. It just got away from that. And you hear these songs and you're like, man, this is the fucking hit song in the world. And you're like, this is ass shitty. <laughs> doesn't even matter if it's not the music you like. You know what I'm saying? If I hear a good single, you know, and it's not my kind of music. Man, that's a good song. Not like like yeah. living La Vida Loca. Okay, I they, I don't go Latino dancing every day of the week, but boy, when that song came out, I'm like that fucking hook is instant. It's there. Right, I was and about to say take oh. something and make it work. See, she <laughs> knows. I agree with everything you're saying. A good song is a good song, and exactly, I, I, and that's I'm how I'm always going to be. You know, and yeah. I get that from my growing up with my Pat Benatars and my fucking Go Go's and my. My kiss. Well, saying, you know? saying that, what would you say was the most influential thing that brought you to want to start or, and, you know, with Deceased? Musically, it was Kiss. It was Kiss. I mean, Kiss took me by storm. It was the Beatles when I was a super young lad. It was the first band I could, the reason I say the Beatles is because when I'd hear music, I'd sing along to it. The Beatles was the first band. I wasn't listening to anything and it was stuck in my head. I want to hold your hand. I'd be across the room. There'd be no music playing. I'd remember it. So the hooks yeah. were there. Then it became Kiss, half of it because of the time with the kids and Gene Simmons and the blood and all that. I'm not going to act like it didn't because it pulled a lot of kids in. It but did. I thought they had the songs to go with it and the craziness and the energy and all that. Then it became Black Sabbath. And then, you know, then it became Maiden and that kind of stuff. Sabbath, Sabbath I got to late in the game. Just a quick side note. First time I we used to go to my friend's dance house and his brother had all these tapes. And we'd be like, let's play these tapes to see if we like any of it. Oh, fuck yeah, Van Halen, this is killer. Fucking, we get into Van Halen. But then he had a lot of hippie shit. Be like, oh man, what is this? Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And it wasn't that we didn't like it, but it wasn't our go-to as a kid heavy metal. You know, we were into we were into we were into Ted Nugent, we were into Frank Marino, the, the, just the bands at that time. And Black Sabbath. So we pulled this tape and I we put it on. It was paranoid. It was fucking Planet Caravan of all fucking songs. We're like. <laughs> and we threw it to the side and then we were going to go see acdc for those about to rock tour 1981 and my friend marcel's dad got it was going to get us tickets he comes back he goes dude acdc had nothing but nosebleeds they said you couldn't even see the fucking band i got you black sabbath tickets and we were like i was like black sabbath they fucking suck right and he's like oh man no they're classic right you don't know iron man i was like no i don't know what the fuck this is right I'm like 11 years old, something like that, 12 maybe. And at the time, there was a song on the radio I kept hearing. I didn't know who it was, but it was the coolest song on the radio. Well, it turned out it was fucking Heaven and Hell, Black Sabbath. And I'm like, that's the same fucking man that had that shitty ass song that I heard on this hippie tape. Because his brother was a he was a he was a Woodstocker guy, you know, it was Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. And I and I like that music, but but that wasn't what I wanted to hear when I was a kid. And we went and saw Black Sabbath, and literally when they did heaven and hell with the piece of sign of the southern cross and they brought the cross to the front of the stage and it came down and it shot fire and it like blew my mind this was december 3rd 1981 that's when i sold my soul to fucking not to rock and roll but to heavy metal i said this is what i'm gonna do with my fucking life this is what i'm gonna do and i became the biggest sabbath freak we wore the mob rules jersey like 87 days in a row to school no shit about that and that's just where it all turned and then i went into overdrive finding these fucking bands i knew your rush your ozzy even stuff like sammy hager or lesser known stuff triumph you know that kind of shit was there kansas but then that's when it really kicked into and let's get the maidens let's get all the priests let's get into 
the underground and then i did get to the underground it became warlord and bitch and metal massacre and slayer and fucking merciful fate and voivod and you know how it goes from there tape trading they were all into fucking iron angel and creator which was tormentor then and blah 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 but that's how it all started if, if the band that really started it all for me would be kiss wow yeah <laughs> like a lot oh, of the yeah! things a lot, a lot of the things you're saying <laughs> is kind of like uh very similar to how uh same as me first time i heard neon knights i was like is that black sabbath like <laughs> what the fuck happened to them like oh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> If I hadn't heard those Iron Man and shit on the radio, I didn't hear Paranoid back when I was a kid. They never played it. I mean, we would get some stuff, but it wasn't that. It would be Van Halen was the hit band at the time. It was, you know, it was Cradle Rock was on the radio all the time, things like that. And that was cool to me. But yeah, that, that Black Sabbath just took me to fucking another world. And here I stand all these years later, still loving it. I turn <laughs> I my do camera, have like, see this whole uh, wall have... over here is Black Sabbath <laughs> over here. <laughs> I have like two questions for you, like uh, before we start thinking about wrapping up. So it's not the longest episode ever in the history of rock <laughs> fantasy. Um, my first, my first question is that uh, is that uh, is deceased ever played in Canada? Yes. Okay. Twice. Where? We played in Montreal for Cataclysm guy. Okay. What's his name, Mauricio? Yeah, Mauricio. We played for we played with Brutal Truth and Monstrosity up there. I think that was '94. We played up there, and then we played at a. I can't. I, I don't know exactly where this was, but it was a, it was like a big opera house kind of place, and it was us and a bunch of Doom bands. It was like pay like I think it was like um, November's Doom, maybe uh, bands like that. Um, Green Carnation, isn't it? The guy from Enslaved or Emperor, one of those bands. And we were totally out of place there, but we went and played that for, um, oh my God, he passed away, great guy. Oh man, oh, it's blowing my mind. I can't remember his name right now. Talking about oh, LG? Shit. Who? Talking about LG? It, no, it was, um, it was, um, damn, he, he died of pneumonia. Um, Are you talking about? Oh, uh, uh, oh my God. Help me guys and ladies. New York, oh my God. Oh. He lived in Canada. He lived in Canada. Heavy guy. Heavy guy with a beard. Come on, John. Come on. Uh, I, I, man, I feel awful. Um, God damn it. Uh, I can't think of his fucking name, man. Fuck. Yeah. Once you say it, I'm going to, uh. Was that, <laughs> was that in Montreal he, 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 as well? He did it with, who? Was that in Montreal as well? Adrian, what's his name? Adrian Bromley? Oh yeah, yeah, Adrian, yeah. Right, yeah, that's, that's who it is. From Adrian Un Bromley. Unrestrained magazine, yeah. That's it. Uh, he set the show up, yeah. and he told me he, was super he said, cool. "Man, this is a fucking, this is a slow night, man. But I need you to come up here and wake these, you know, send these motherfuckers to hell." <laughs> we went up there. It was, dude, Chris Bruni. You could ask Chris yeah. Bruni this. Everybody was standing there watching these bands like they were like watching Jimi Hendrix. They were all just standing there like falling out. Right. We got up there. We kicked sick thrash. It was the first tune. I watched these fucking dudes just their head flew off, man. They did backflips. They got out of there as quick as they could. And you saw all these guys run to the front with their thrash shirts on and go nuts. It was like a switch. It was a great time. That's it. That's it. That's it. We were supposed to come up a couple other times, but we just didn't, we just didn't make it up there. I mean, for the longest time when Mike and Mark were in the band, they just couldn't get away. Me and Les always wanted to go, 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 but they had to do a lot of work. And we had to play a lot of weekend warrior shit. And how far can you get in a weekend kind of game? It's like, Friday, we can get to North Carolina, and by Saturday, we might be able to get to South Carolina, but we got to be back Sunday because they got to go to work on Monday. That was yeah. one of our biggest biggest things that worked against us through all those years, man, was, I mean, I, John, I saw you out going, 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 going. That was fucking awesome, man. Because We couldn't do that, man. I would love to have been able to do it, but we couldn't do it. And by the time we, you know, when Mark and him left the band and I got in the guy, Shane, and people wanted to go, we went and did it. I mean, we did like in 2010, we went and did like 100 shows. Wow. Yeah. Well, time time to think about uh, bringing you guys up back to Canada at some point. Absolutely, the Kenny Rogers yeah. Fest. I love it. I don't want some of these. <laughs> Kenny Rogers, country rock world. all night. That's it. Uh, <laughs> and the the other question I have for you is: I've seen the seas play once in my life, um, and the night is uh, <laughs> the night is very very foggy for me. 
<laughs> but I remember being there and it was in Florida. And it would have been between like, I would say 93 and 96. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't in Miami, but it would have been like on that side of Florida. We have played done- West Palm at Beach. that time. We did, we did three, we did two shows down there. One of them was with, we did one show with atheist and we did one show with pain eater and burial burial played both. That's shows. It. That's, that's it. when it was pain, pain eater. It was a Friday night show and it was at a club that was all ages and it was all kids in there. I got the video of that. Well, that's the one we went down there. We actually went down there. We got, it was two shows. It was Friday and Sunday. We couldn't fill in the Saturday, but it was a Friday night with pain eater, Bob from pain eater and um, burial played too. That's the one. Is that in West Palm? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to tell you wrong. I don't know. You, I know you're Florida, <laughs> you know it all down there. I don't even know when I was down there and I saw you last where we were. Where was I? What was that that was that uh, brass mug? mug? That's right. Is Pain Eater still? Yeah, around? I don't know where it was. It was no. a crazy show though, man. It was like I'm just a, like kids were out like I wanna it was say like it was twenty one I wanna movie. say it was twenty one north in West Palm Beach. It could be right. I don't think that was like true. around that time. It was like you went from the like Cameo Theater and then it was after the cameo was like the tree house and then it moved to like summers on the beach and then it went to 21 north so it was like always like that progression of shows i i remember the show with with atheist was at town lounge remember that one i'm a, are you, was that on the east coast no that sounds like that was probably <laughs> i wish i could help Florida. you i wish i wish my i wish my camera would freeze now <laughs> I want to say Town Lounge was probably Sarasota. <laughs> That's probably an atheist thing. Yeah, it was Town. Yeah, it was crazy. Well, that was a crazy show. Our 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 only roadie was was tripping on acid, and both Mark and Mike both both broke strings on the same song. And this motherfucker comes up there trying to fix them both. It couldn't fix either. I was like, just sit the fuck down. <laughs> it's inside joke he got food poisoning driving down there in richmond and he was just sick the whole time we ended up going to like morris town and we we stayed at ben meyer's house so nasty savage one time and he wrote this acoustic song about all of us dying or something it was it was morbidly cool because <laughs> <laughs> ben's the best <laughs> yeah total freak uh, so only one it. time there um mr dennis yeah that's it. Probably wasn't the best show he ever played, but maybe. Well, I, I'll be honest. I don't remember much of it. The only reason I remember going there is because, like, I, I still have like, uh, uh, like either a poster of flyers uh, from that show, and uh, but we were we were we were flying high. Oh no! Oh no! Yeah. That's it for me. You man. made it through it. Yeah, made it through it. I'm trying to find that show. I, yeah, I'll try to talk if I can. I don't know if it's going to work again. <laughs> I, I was going to ask um, King, I wanted to ask you if you had some cool memories or some stories about the G. Willikers times, like especially with those parties and stuff afterwards. I and mean, we had some insane parties back then. <laughs> <laughs> we sure did, didn't we? All I, the things I remember the most about G. Willikers was the first time we ever played there was a friend of mine, Rennie Resmini, who plays in a band called Starkweather over here. He was a dear pen pal. Maybe you remember Rennie? They used to, he used to, I think he used to write with um, Scott Helick for Total Thrash. Okay, remember yeah. Total Thrash, Matt? Yeah, totally, totally. He, well, he came to see us play, and he broke up a skinhead fight while we were playing, and they kicked him out, and he didn't do anything wrong. So we actually stopped playing and fucking told the club to fuck itself, and we left like five songs in, the very first time we played G Willikers, and we're like, we'll never fucking play here again. And then Annie Frantic took it over. She's like, you got to come back. I'm running it now. There's no problems in here, blah, 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 blah. And we went back and we played. And every time we played, we had a good time, but it just seemed like there was so much trouble with the, the, the like the, it was so much hardcore against the metal kids, the skins, yes, the racism, all that stuff. I remember being there one time in Corpus Rodas, uh, some of those guys, like, 
big fight. I'm talking like people getting bashed in with hard drum hardware, like taken out in stretchers and fucking like unconscious and stuff. But the parties at Annie Frantic's house were unreal. I mean, that one classic one that um, that John uh, Verica shot, Ver- yeah, where we where we went head first down the, the stairs repeatedly, and I was wearing like somebody's bare feet or something. Um, <laughs> like we're gonna, you know, I'm not gonna. You gotta buy. I think it was the Abominog seven inch. You gotta buy this fucking seven inch. I'm gonna slide down these fucking stairs on my by my face. It was me and a guy Chuck Parsons, and um, <laughs> just it, being in there and fucking just. I mean, every time we went there, it was so many people would show up. You know, yes. be like, oh look, here's the Gorophobia guys. Here's the incantation. Here's oh, she always was hanging out with what was it, Damnability or Dominance? Yeah. Those yeah, bands. Dominance. I remember those <laughs> yeah. bands. And it'd always be, you know, Annie loved everybody equally. She was, she looked out for everybody back then. She did. And uh, we spent the night. I remember the one time we had to play. It was, I think it was with you guys the next day. I think it was you guys, us, and the uh, Gorephobia. At, oh, was that Dobbs? The, was that where it was, or was it at the gr- the grill? I thought it was at the roadside grill. I thought it was J.C. Dobbs. The roadside oh, well, Casey grill. J.C. Dobbs at- was the one. Okay. Yeah, and uh, we we were gonna play, and fucking, she was like, "You gotta come get Mark out of my room. He's destroyed everything." And I think Janice <laughs> lived there, and he's like, "You gotta get everything out of the room. He's you get him out of there." I opened the door, and he'd rip every fucking thing in the place to the ground. I'm like, "What are you on?" He's like, "I'm fucked up, man. I'm fucked up." I'm like, "We gotta play. It's a matinee, huh?" And we went there, and when we went on stage and played, he couldn't remember anything on Nuclear Exorcist at all. He didn't know how to play it. And he, hey, we got the video, soundboard, and everything. He didn't know how to play any of it. He's just like, burr, burr. like he was fucking, he was George Harrison, man. He was fucking up so bad. And I almost, and I back then I was hanging out with Kim, and um, I almost flipped over the fucking railing. I was so hungover. I went to read. Uh, it had a second floor there, didn't it? On the side there above the stage. And I was like leaning over and I literally went over, but caught myself. It was insane. I remember that. I remember um, another time hanging up. I think Dan Lokler was up there. We played with um, Brutal Truth, one of their first shows um, over there. And uh, that I don't know if that was the night where I drank the motor oil or not. It might have been. I think it might have been. I, I, I know one time I played with a bombing up there. And uh, yeah, I, somebody gave me a fucking, we had no more beer. So I drank a fucking a quarter of motor oil dude just downed it and then old danny luckler took a little just a little hit it was gone and had the little black ring at the top he went and had it on his lip right here he's like man i'm like motherfucker i'm fucking over here fucking dying but the weirdest part was i didn't get sick off that i didn't feel sick nothing the years later i told this story at a party in virginia and they were like bullshit you'd have fucking died you'd be fucking dead you'd be shit and blood and blah 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 i'm like nah man nothing happened i said produce a court right now and i'll do it again they quit in an apartment. They couldn't find any, but they brought some Wesson cooking oil out, and I chugged that down, sick as a fucking dog off that. Man. So, I, you know, I, oh, I drink motor oil. But, yeah, that's one of those people that comes to me to this day. You're the guy that drank motor oil. So it was 10W30, and I ran good for a month. I was going to say, what brand was it? It was 10W30 Quaker State, I remember. Uh, no, what? Oh, wait a minute, am I lying? No, I'm lying. It was fucking Valvoline. It was a red, it was a red carton, Valvoline. <laughs> I'm lying. I apologize. <laughs> Pop me there and I'll, oopsie. But yeah, but I love those parties. I know you did too. We'd all sit around those things. I think I introduced all you guys to the chandeliers drinking game, the real fast uh, chugging the beer games, man. And just everybody was sick and throwing up and it was great. <laughs> I wouldn't change it for the world. I always remember the goddamn, was it Dwayne Allman poster she had in her dining room, the huge poster of him. You know what I'm yeah. that? I'm just like, God damn, every time I come here, he's looking at me, the eyes follow you. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Alfred Hitchcock photo. Yeah. <laughs> but fucking classic times, brother. I mean, I, I'm i glad we got to do them. You know, it, it, I, I'm beat up from it. You know, I don't know how you feel, war-torn and shit, but I, I feel pretty damn good overall. I've been through a lot of shit, man. Strokes and fucking all that shit through the years, but it is what it is, man. We just keep on going on. Yeah, I, I know. That's earlier, crazy. Getting away from all that shit. I mean, that, that had not, I mean, who knows, but I mean, when I had that stroke in 2004, they they didn't know what caused it. I was in the hospital for a week. I mean, I was fucked up. I'm still fucked up my left side, and I'm left-handed, so it's kind of weird. But um, in 2010, we were on tour that time when we did those 100 shows. I was at, in um, Las Vegas, and we were leaving, and I started having these really weird, like, heart beatings, crazy. And I fucking was, and I went to the uh, I went to the hotel. We went to Arizona, and when we got there. 
I, everybody was asleep and I went to the fucking uh, front desk. It was like seven in the morning. And I said to the lady, do I look weird to you? <laughs> and oh, she, yeah. and you know, after you play a show, I mean, I look weird right now, but you know, you look weird to you. And she's like, what do you mean? I think she thought I was going to rob her or something. I said, look, I'm, my heart's beating funny. She's like, you have anything weird? I'm like, look, I'm not on drugs, lady. I'm not on anything. I'm sober, but something's, my heart's acting funny, right? So she called, I said, no ambulance, no sirens. Don't wake everybody up at seven o'clock in the fucking morning. She brings the fire department there and they're like, dude, your fucking heart's beating crazy weird. I recommend you go to the hospital. So they brought the ambulance, didn't turn the sirens on, got me to the hospital. And then they asked me if I'd ever had any problems with blood clots or a stroke. And I said, yeah, I had a stroke in 2004. So they thought maybe that AFib is what they, they diagnosed me with is what it was the whole time. But that, that was, that sucked, dude. That was, that sucked shit. I mean, it fucked me up to this day. I can't, that's one of the reasons I don't even try to play that much drums even when we're fucking around. I still write all the drum tracks for the shit, but these two, this pinky and this next finger, they don't work, man, for shit. Like, it's hard that, to hold a stick, especially it, fast stuff. If we're playing Maiden or something, it's not bad, but if I was to play fast, it's a nightmare. It's so a you, nev- nightmare. you never fully but, recovered from it, but... No, but, I, but I'm lucky that the thing kept on track going because they said if it had got stuck, it I wouldn't have never woke up. I went to bed, I woke up, I remember... I was typing with somebody online and they're like, dude, you're typing terrible. I mean, I type terrible anyway, but it was like so bad. They're like I, I can't, illegible. And I thought, man, I better go back to sleep. So I laid down, I woke up, my stepfather came over and his friend and they said, your whole face is drooping. Like, you know, like this, I, I ignored him. We fucking went on with the day. Uh, my son's mother came home. She said, something's wrong. Maybe you had a stroke. I went to sleep again. I, I didn't go to the, the hospital that day. Wow. The next day was a Saturday morning. I went to the hospital. They said, one of two things happened to you. Either you had a stroke or you had an aneurysm. And it's better if you had a stroke. And I said, why? And they said, because a stroke is in one place. An aneurysm is all over your brain. It just, everything just deactivates. And they said, you definitely had a stroke. And I was in there for a week. They tried to figure out what caused it. And they didn't know, like I said, until six years later. And I had like John Hopkins specialties. Because they were like, dude, you're 30 years old too young to be here i was only i was 36 when it happened so but you know you keep going woe is me fuck all that man (laughs) you know it happens shit happens in a lifetime you know we've had a lot of shit happen to us but yeah keep going man life don't give a fuck about that man you gotta just get up and go man yeah well it seems i mean you've done really well since then so it's good to know that you didn't let it stop you or whatever you know that's that's a true metal fast runner for a big boy too if anybody's out there who wants to race come on bring it on (laughs) So I'm not into running. Dash. You love running? Love running. Um, <laughs> what, I'll walk one other qu- one other question I oh <laughs> one one other question I had too was when you switched to just doing vocals, was it difficult to work with a drummer and have a drummer want to play to stuff like for you to describe your way of wanting to do this because your style is untraditional? Well, well, Dave, Dave Castillo, who's passed away now. When he came into the band, he did the October thing, and I told him, just do what you want to do there. When it came to the cease, I was a little more um, tight-gripped on that to tell him what to do, and he learned it, which was so cool because he learned how to play it. And like I said earlier, my I, my specialty as a drummer is my hands. I can fly all this shit. I can move and groove and spot on, but my feet are just slow. I'm short, I have short legs, that kind of thing. This guy was in shape like a motherfucker, double bass and everything and he just came in i'm like you're you're me now with better with better feet and he learned it and he always used to say sam biles uh is, sam biles is famous for doing this we went up to pittsburgh he goes hey man what's your name dave you think king can sit in for one song i just want to hear him play one song for the old days right <laughs> and, dave, <laughs> and dave and dave would always be like this i'll do dave's voice because it's how he was man See, these motherfuckers don't want me to play, man. They want you to fucking play, man. Come on, dude. Just fucking play, man. Fuck this shit, right? And I'd be like, hey, man, dude, you're a way better drummer than me, dude. You're doing great. You're yourself. Just ignore this when it happens. It, it, it didn't happen much, but to him, it was always happening because it would just be enough time to pass what would happen again where he thought it was happening every day. And then, then he got to be himself, and I was like, dude, you're killing. You're fucking killing. And then he always said, however you need it, it's fine. And once in a blue moon, you go back to something like Luck of the Corpse, and he'd be like, how'd you play this? I'm like, just play it as fast as you fucking can, because that's all I did back then. Then the later <laughs> stuff, you know, it fell into the pocket more. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That kind of stuff. But, I mean, that guy was just the, the coolest, man. I mean, 
he was the fucking coolest. He 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 understood everything. He was definitely a hundred percent part of the band, man. He was he was the drummer for Deceased back then. He was just, it was it was awesome, man. He, and he and he learned it really quick, and you know, and we we were the best of friends, you know. Just in case anybody, anybody li- reading or listening doesn't fucking understand, he passed away three years ago. He drowned out of the blue, man. He went to El Salvador for vacation at Thanksgiving, and he drowned in the fucking in a fucking ocean he never should have fucking been in. They were famous for fucking riptides and it took him out man that's fucking that broke my fucking heart too just one of many things you know the old story about the car wreck and 88 and all that stuff where a hit and run where doug's brother was killed our bass player rob was killed from the evil side of religion uh other and our best one of our best friends larry and then another friend survived it and he told what happened and all this shit that happened we lost our replacement drummer for dave when dave had a child eric he passed away he got fucking sick and died in his thirties. So, and we've had our share of that shit too, you know. And you know they always say that doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. You got to go on, you know. You got to keep on going. And the hardest one, we were still kids and we were just coming off of drugs. I know I was. Was when Rob passed away. That was that was the hardest time. And I was twenty years old. I had just quit drugs at nineteen. I had been living and staying at home for almost a year. I was so fucked up from drugs, and I was I went cold turkey, man, off PCP, cocaine, all that shit. And it was hard, man. It was really fucking hard. And right when I, the, the weirdest part was the fucking first, it was the first day we jammed back. My mom bought me a drum kit. She was so proud. I came off drugs. She bought me this $2,500 fucking, it was like the drummer for loudness's kit, man. Huge fucking mirror fucking. She was proud of me, man. I went out there yeah. and I was better, man. I could play good beats and stuff. And it was only me, Doug and Mark that day because fucking Rob had to go to college he went to the after you know afternoon college and that afternoon he called me he said man how did it go i said dude it was fucking amazing dude we're back man tomorrow you're jamming right you're coming over tomorrow yeah i don't gotta go to school tomorrow fucking great he goes man we're all gonna party at my house tonight i said i don't think i'm gonna make it dude i'm a little beat up i'm still coming off the drugs i'm you know i'm still beat down and shit but tomorrow i'll see you man and that night they all went to go to his house to drink and party it up and on the way there they got a flat tire and a van came over the hill while they were standing outside of it, waiting for Doug to change it, and it just sideswiped and killed them all, man. Crazy, it was fucking awful, dude. It was fucking awful. And Doug never recovered from that. And that's probably one of the reasons he didn't stay around, you know. But a couple of years after that, for luck of the corpse, he, I, I, I don't know what, how the hell he survived it, man. It was awful, and it was the biggest thing on the news. I remember all that shit. Like K- Katie Couric, who's now like one of the biggest newscasters in the world. She was local, Catherine Couric back then. She was interviewing him. And stuff, and every time they had to bring up the name of the band. They played in the band called Deceased, you know, and they were kept showing pictures of, you know, Venom and Voivod shirts and look like we're a bunch of trash, which we probably yeah. were, but never has to do with the story. And Doug had to go through all that stuff. And he witnessed it all, man. He saw everybody dead. It was I won't go into the, the details, but turned around yeah. heads, all that kind of shit, man. Yeah, no, Under, that's to be Rob tough. Rob was a big boy and he was thrown over 130 feet. Wow. That's how, that's how fast that guy, and the guy didn't stop either. It ended up being an Oriental uh, laundry mat owner, and the next day he turned himself in, said it was carbon monoxide poisoning in his van. At some point, his wife mentioned something about he drank a bunch of sake at some get-together that night. He, he claims he just thought he hit a guardrail. And I, I don't know what to this day, I don't know the whole story because it got so fucking out of hand. I don't think he ever served much time at all in jail, if any, because he had the money to, you know, you know how that goes. That's it was ugly, but you know we 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 had to go on, dude. I love those guys to this day, man. I miss them fucking dearly, man. They're always included in everything we do, man. I'm always thinking about all of them, man. Yeah, that's that's terrible. I remember hearing about that story back then. That's it just... was it was terrible, man. And we just we went on for them, you know. That's what we do. But moving forward, Children of the Morgue, we're gonna get, do get that record done. We're doing a thing right now called Thrash Times at Ridgemont High. We just covered what? a bunch of. It's called Thrash Times at Ridgemont High. We just covered it. Um, we did um, we did Thrashing Rage from Voivod. We do Pray for Death from Blessed Death. We do Spit on Your Grave from Whiplash. Leads off the record because it's the greatest thrash metal record ever made. We <laughs> covered some Cyclone. We covered some Bulldozer. We covered some Rigor Mortis. We did some Death Wish. We do some Darkness from Germany. We didn't go with the with the, with the typicals because we've covered Slayer and Creator and Sodom and shit over the years. So we went with some lesser known kind of stuff. We do Sacrifice. Please tell sacrifice me there's a there. Thrash Time at Ridgemont High shirt. I need that. There you go. That's oh, killer. So instead of instead of the van shoes, it's high top Nikes on the cover. That's what we grew up with. But it is called Thrash Times Ridgemont High, and it's got a nice photo motif of us all um, morphed into the characters. I'm Mike Damone. 
Arjo <laughs> Amos is Spicoli. Um, then you got Mr. Vargas is, is Shane. He plays Mr. Vargas. And then our one guitar player, Matt, who's shy with the girls to begin with, he's he's rat in there. Uh, and then um, Walter <laughs> is um, Walter is Brad Hamilton. And he's got the, you know, 100, Mr. 100% of your ass hat on. <laughs> Best movie. My favorite movie of all time. It is, it is a good I love one. that movie. I need yeah. I need it for that okay I'll, I'll send you a picture of the cover and stuff and oh my god please that is it'll amazing. be out well, it should be out halloween we, we had we, some studio time we had to when they came back we had to share the studio time with the other 50 bands that didn't get to record during covid too so that's it. coming we're getting that out and we're gonna we're, we're playing some shows we're gonna be playing some in the east coast here with abominogs back doing a few shows we're playing in new york we're playing in dc we're playing in philly in september we're gonna go to texas with cardiac arrest we'll be playing the other shows with awesome. us too in november we're just going to do those shows get back to it next year we plan to do a lot of gigging again cool so is there any more questions anybody has ralph um robin <laughs> i got one no yeah what's up i was going to ask about the stroke and i was going to but um, i had a backup one um i've been reading this book it's taking me forever to read it's like 750 pages it's uh, the Slayer magazine from Norway, and um, it's it's a huge book. But anyway, there's a great interview with Kingsley on there, and then there's uh, they had a section called Old Thrash Bastards, and had uh, they featured Mark Adams in one of the issues. But um, the part that I'm at right now, and it is at right after Chuck died from death, and it was an interview with Gene Hoagland. And he's talking about this phone line that they had back in the day where a bunch of people can get on it and they were scamming somehow so everybody could talk for free, kind of like a party line. And he <laughs> said, that, yes. said like Killjoy, Killjoy was on it and my, they would get Kerry King, Kerry King every now my and again. Best, and my could, best friend in elementary school was Bill Ford, who actually lived with John Han, who did not play on the Death Screen Buddy Gore album. He... Uh, Bill Ford's dad worked for the Tandy Corporation, which is Radio Shack. They moved to California, and he started a band out there called Decapitation, and then he went on to do Necropolis uh, band, too. But he um, he had a thing called the Phone Pirates. It was him, and he would call people up. We we were on this thing. Gene Hogan was on there. We had, we had Bobby Ellsworth on there from Overkill. We had Betsy Bitch. We had Gary Holt. We had Kronos on the thing one time. We had Tom Warrior on there. We had Caton on there. We had Chuck from Death on there. We had a couple of the guys from Sacrifice, I think, were on there, Les Evans from Cryptic Slaughter. And the thing was, like, right now, just imagine 12 people like me just not shutting up. That's all you heard was, oh, yeah, that's all it was. There was no separation. There was no way to know who was talking. Nobody would shut up. And we, he, they, what they did, they, like you said, it was like a conference call. And all of us were on this thing for free. We just call out and we would just talk about <laughs> shit. And you, it was it was best when you first got on with two guys because you could keep up. But once it got going, it'd be like Chuck would be talking to Gaten and I'd be talking to Bobby Ellsworth, but the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so that, but that yeah, it was called the Phone Pirates. That was like 1980. I'm going to say 84, I think, or 80, yeah, probably 84, 85, right there. It was before we did a demo yet. And Bill was my best friend. He went to school with me. We, we actually, my first band was called Slack Tide. We had a band in 1980. I was 12 years old. Bill went to school with me in elementary in Virginia. Then he moved to Savannah, Georgia. And he said, we're going to form a band called Slack Tide. I didn't know what that meant at the time. And I said, okay, what are we doing? He said, we're going to do a bunch of cover songs. And he sends me the songs he wants me to learn. And I'm playing bass at 12. And I told you I was at 15. So just imagine how bad I was at 12. Okay. <laughs> and the first, we, the, the first song I ever sang live was You May Be Right from Billy Joel. I was 12 I years old. It. We learned that. <laughs> we learned rock and roll fantasy from Bad Company. We learned Love Gun from Kiss. We learned um, My Sharona from The Knack. We learned um, Train Kept a Rolling. We did Aerosmith version. And we had one more tune. I always forget what that other fucking tune was. We we went and played the show. This guy Andy was in fifth grade. He played guitar. We took a bus down to down to Savannah, Georgia. Just me and this guy. I can't believe we were like 12 and 11 years old. And they let us take a bus down there. We played a show. I got pictures of this stuff. I was playing bass. He was on. Bill played drums. Andy played guitar. And we thought we were the shit. But then this little girl who was there was friends with Bill's mother. She came up and she knew how to play Keep On Loving You from Mario Speedwagon on the piano. So she played that and everybody's like, oh, she's so cute. So they didn't give a fuck about us anymore. 
So that was it. But yeah, then he moved to California. We didn't get to have a band like we were going to have. We, 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 we did Kiss in the fucking sixth grade talent show and all that shit. But he was great. Sadly, he's passed away too. But he uh, was a great friend for years. And that phone pirates thing was classic, brother. It was. I remember Betsy Bitch going, don't call me at work ever a fucking again. <laughs> <laughs> classic. Is this Betsy Bitch? And then she would say, this is Betsy Wise, whatever her name was. She's like, who is this? And all of us like, hey, what's up, man, baby? Yeah. And she's like, don't ever fucking call me at work again. <laughs> Amazing. We'd get everybody's phone number and just call them. I remember Mark, Mark used to bother fucking uh, Mike uh, from, um, from fucking Possessed. He used to always bother Mike Tararo. Call him up like, yeah, man. And Mike, <laughs> I remember one time Mike said, I got to go, man. I'm getting my hair styled and shit. <laughs> <laughs> The classic days, man. We all had a wing back then. We all had a little fair faucet here, a little fair faucet there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were young. We didn't know no better, man. My mom one time said, if you want your hair to grow, you got to go to a stylist. I'm like, a fucking stylist? What the fuck is that? She takes you up to her, it's like a beauty salon. You know, you yeah. like a, I said, mom, this is, I said, mom, this is fruity shit. Never again. <laughs> then I just said, I want it to be like this. I didn't want it any style. I just wanted to be bad. <laughs> it worked out well huh <laughs> but, <laughs> it's just fucking air uh, awesome well I, I got one last question before we wrap this up is you mentioned before do you, you watched Blood Beat do you like Blood Beat the movie Blood, Blood Beach Beat. oh I thought you said Blood Beat you said Blood Beach okay Blood that's Beat. better wait a minute Blood Beat I know Blood Beat which one is Blood Beat Big box back in the day, VHS blood beat. Uh, is it the same movie? I'm not, I'm not Me? sure. It's, it's the one where it's like, I don't know, the killer ends up, it's like some hillbilly movie, but it ends oh, up being man, like some kind of samurai that, that ends up being the killer or something like yes, that. I remember that. Yeah, I had the big box <laughs> VHS of that, dude. I haven't seen that in so long, brother. But when you said, I was like, blood beat, I know, I know that. I was thinking Blood Beach, the one where it said they stole the Jaws thing, just when you think it's safe to go back in the water. Yeah, and yeah. Reach it. yeah. I, love, no. I love that trash. My mom took me to every goddamn movie. You couldn't name one. We didn't see it to drive in. Skip just because because Blood Blood Beat might have been one of the worst horror movies I've ever seen, but I figured maybe maybe there's someone out there that really likes it, and I figured maybe you. No, maybe yeah, yeah, you. no. Blood <laughs> Beach for me, and that wasn't very good either. <laughs> <laughs> but it had it had um it had Paulie in it from fucking Rocky. He was the main. He was the cop. Uh, did you ever see Blood Beach? It was a scene I where the guy screw, he was screwing his girlfriend. And the, the monster lives in the sand. It pulled his wiener off. Yeah. And the kids come and they're like they're like uh, officer. Here's his wiener. <laughs> and now we're back. We've gone full circle. Now we're back to wiener talk. That's how it all started. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I guess we'll we'll end, we'll end it on wiener talk. Yeah. Let's uh, end it on that. <laughs> Okay, it's been well, a blast, man. I had a, I had a blast, guys, and and Robin, yeah, of course, Lee. awesome. Hey, yeah, and I just want to okay. say one thing that uh, if anybody wants to hear some more of these really good stories and great tales, uh, King does have an autobiography, oh, and uh, it's really awesome. It's a great read, and if you haven't checked it out, uh, please pick it up and uh, promise you won't be disappointed. There's some really funny stories from back in the day. And, been out uh, of print for years. I've been trying to get it for years. I'll All get right. it back in print soon. It's called Stay Ugly. I'm gonna get it back in print soon. We printed, we pressed it three times, wait. and it really did sell. It went quick. It wasn't. I think we only did like 400 copies total. But I'm gonna get it back in print soon. I, I'm, I'm doing another book. I'm, I need to get on it. It's called I'm a Grandpa Now, and Grandpa <laughs> gets to tell the best stories. You know that. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm a grandpa too, so I know that, brother. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're all in this together. But um, what I was gonna say um. It, Ralph, if you if you want, I can email you the book if you want to read if you want to read it off of an email. Like I can give you a PDF file. You can read the whole damn thing if you want. I'm I'm a huge collector of books. I gotta have the original. I can't. Okay. I, or, or if I had, if I had access to any extra one, I'd give it to you. I've already run that route like twice. I pulled from like two people. Like yeah, I don't need my collection. And pass it on. But I only <laughs> have. I don't. I, I for a while I didn't even have one for myself. I got one back for me, but. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it too. I, it was fun. That was that was a good Just time. Gotta yeah, that was it. Fun. I, I read it on on Facebook all the time. You, you you put up excerpts of it of it all the time on Facebook and uh I, I just want to read the whole thing from start to finish and sure. own it. Sure. So I'll, I'll definitely keep reprint. you I'll keep you in the mix for sure, brother, on that when I get it going. I am gonna put it back in i I think I'll press another hundred of them myself and just get them as you know, just to make my money back. I don't need to make nothing. 
I just I want to get it out there because a lot of people missed out on it too, and they asked me, and I, I I'm proud of it. it. It's you know people expected it to be more like dirty and this and that. The guy that helped me well wanted me to write it. He wanted to do all these stories. I told him he's like, why weren't they in the book when you wrote it? I'm like, some of them are, but you, you know when you start talking about the death of your mother or you know just things in your life like what I was talking about earlier, the accident and stuff, that just becomes secondary. You know, there's there's time and place for all of it, and I, it actually fell together pretty nicely. I think. You know, I'm, 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 I am, I'm very proud of it. It took me three years to write it once I started, but I'm happy. And thanks it's, for it's a really that up there. I, I really enjoyed it, man. So looking forward to the next one. That, that's awesome though, to have, to get out those stories, you know, you, just the metal in general, it's important that people know about all this stuff that's happened because if we don't, you know, do a books or just do even do these kind of interviews to tell these stories, you know, this history can get lost and it's just a sad thing because I think we, we sh all share an amazing time in metal, you know, just different than people won't, won't understand it unless they hear the actual stories, I think, you know, and even You're then right, they won't understand. And all of us here, we all had our, we've all grown up pretty much the same way, you know, yeah. slight variations thereof, but man, we're all in this together and that's the way it's always should be. And that's why I love the underground. And now we're yeah. back to the very, very start of this thing again, where the underground is <laughs> the thing where you just, you just, you just live your life, you know, and you're cool with everybody. And if somebody fucks up along the way, you say, Hey man, get it right. And if they don't want to get it right, then you, you, you fucking kick them in the fucking head. You move on, dude. Yeah. yeah that's how it goes. I mean, we've, yeah. we've all seen our share of good, bad, and the ugly, but at yeah. the end of the day, we're all in this together, man. You know what I'm saying? And, I, I got yeah. said I got twenty. I, I'm fifty three. I'm going to I'm seventy five here. So I don't know how you feel. <laughs> we all got our gray. Now you got more good. gray than me. I only got this little bit right here, man. Yeah. I don't have any here. Yeah. You got any? You, I don't know why. Maybe <laughs> some motor oil sink is soaked in. <laughs> they lubricated everything for you. <laughs> Keeping you <laughs> they, they say somebody actually asked me, "Do I do you dye that that color?" I'm like yeah, like you purposely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay, no, well, seriously. Thanks for everything, John. Thanks to everybody. Yeah. Thanks for everything. And thank well, you for doing this. It was yeah. great. Like, yeah, thank so you very much. I'll see you in Florida, hours. Robin. Really loved I'll it. I'll see you Friday, John, right? Yeah, I'll see you Friday. And yeah, I guess uh, thanks to uh, Ralph. Um, what's it? Uh, Denny is not here, but he, he got it? cut. He got cut. He had a power outage at his house. Um, but yeah. See what happens when you live in Canada? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you have hey. King. Uh, yeah, King A, and uh, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, thank you. We appreciate it, King. It's totally awesome to have you here and to chat with you. And just to hear all these stories brings back lots of memories and a lot of stuff I, I didn't know, too. Also, Robin, of course, it's great to have you. And uh, Steve, appreciate it. It was great. And um, I don't know, what is it? I don't even know. I haven't done this for a while, but just basically, I usually like say something like support the underground support the bands buy stuff from the bands directly go to shows like if you're in raleigh go to the uh october 31 show on friday what's up the poor house i think it's that poor house uh, yeah so go there check it out and just um you know buy you know buy from you know rock fantasy or just other real record stores that are doing it for passion you know not you're not the big, um, you know, the Amazons and stuff only if you have to, you know, but try to go for other routes if you can and support metal. And uh, it's great to be back here with my friends uh, doing this again. It's been a little bit of a break. So uh, we're going to hopefully get back and attract you more of these shows and, you know, see you guys soon and fucking metal. Hell yeah. See you guys. Metal. Hey, metal. <laughs> Love everybody.